Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Delicious things to eat. The popcorn can't be beat. The sparkling drinks are just dandy. The chocolate bars and the candy. So let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. I'm a fan of classic movies. They say, human see, human do. The dear departed once said to me, I never met an ape I didn't like. Look, it's a man! In heaven's name, get rid of that creature! Take your stinking paws off me, you damn dirty ape! He can talk. He can talk, 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 he can talk. I can sing. Ooh, help me, Dr. Zayas. Dr. Zayas, Dr. Zayas. Dr. Zayas, Dr. Zayas. Dr. Zayas, Dr. Zayas. Dr. Zayas. Oh, Dr. Zayas. If man was superior, why didn't he survive? You did it. Cut up his brain, you bloody baboon! What I know of man was written long ago. Set down by the greatest ape of all, our lawgiver. <laughs> you maniacs! You blew it up! Damn you! God damn you all to hell! 20th Century Fox wants you to go ape. Hello and welcome to Overlapping Dialogue, a podcast of audio commentaries dedicated to discussing cinema that fascinates us in a way we hope fascinates you. We're your co-hosts, Kyle Levi Huffman. I'm ooh ooh. I'm ah ah. Oh, sorry there. Uh, it's like we went ape. We, we, we finally went ape. It's gone ape, you know? Yep. Here we are. Yeah. We're at the very Kyle, end. I'm, I'm Kyle, by the nah. way. Yeah. Or I'm Kyle Huffman, and you're not, and you're Levi. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we're finally at the end of our nine film run of the Planet of the Apes franchise. Um, and, of course, today we're talking about the latest, and at this point, last entry in not the franchise. Not the greatest, but, yeah. Uh, War for the Planet of the Apes from 2017. It's hard to believe this movie's already four years old. Yeah, because I remember Russ going to see it, so it's weird. It's, it's already been, been four years. Yep. Um, we're going to dive into the movie here in a little bit, and by the end of the movie, we're actually going to kind of, you know, give a little bit of a wrap-up on our overall thoughts and feelings on this franchise as we've been endeavoring to work our way through it over the last nine episodes. Uh, and if you've Two been months. tuning in yeah, for this, then uh, God bless you, and thank you for your stewardship and your listenership. Um, but first... We want to bring back the segment we started next week, and is going to be a recurring segment on this show. Or the, last week, you mean? What did I say? You next week? Last, yeah. Oh, We're yeah. going to be doing it next week, too. Yeah. Well, well, probably not next no, week. No, not next week, that, but no. after that. Yeah. Uh, anyways, I'm, I'm lost in the timeline. Huh? Yeah, I mean, this, these movies lose you in the timeline, yeah. Are you ah? Uh, or my ooh? <laughs> I can't remember. Uh, the Blue Plate Special. Hi, Audrey. Hello, Emma. Have a cup of coffee, please? Sure. I'll have what she's had. Order up! 
then the order is indeed uh, up. So today we wanted to kind of give some brief impressions and thoughts. Kind of like a grab bag. A it's grab sort of bag. I mean, that's plate, what the blue plate you know? special is going to be. It's just imagine you're in the cafeteria line. And you're just kind and of just like, I want up. I want some of that jello that moves on its own, you know, yeah. like that that I, we don't know what it is, but we say it's jello, you know. Yeah. That's what I'm wanting here, you know. <laughs> a little bit of mystery meat on the side. Oh yeah. Um, we wanted to start off with um, some trailer talk. Mm. Um, three because recent... as everyone knows, Levi Huffman's favorite thing to discuss is movie trailers. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> That's sarcasm, by the yeah. way, because you could. That's uh, what we would call verbal irony, yeah. as I've been teaching my middle schoolers this week. But anyway, you know what's crazy is I feel like um, the accessibility of film trailers on the internet now. The conversations always last longer about the film trailers and the immediate aftermath than they end up doing the movies. Yeah, which is in of itself indicative. I feel like of uh, a lot of big, especially what main big mainstream capitalist society we're living in. You know, the just uh, love of uh, money and industry. But anyway, and yeah. it's always like. Especially with superhero movies, one of which we're going to be... You know, in a weird way, one could construe all three of these as a sort of a superhero movie. not in the One in a <laughs> yeah. much more explicit sense. But even the other two have this weird... Um, the cult of personality Cult of personality people. and or like fan expectation of what yes. they're all going to be, you know. Um, the first of which we want to talk about is Spider-Man No Way one. Home. Yeah. yeah. Um, Spider-Man No Way Home. I, I can't help but say I was delighted to watch this trailer with Levi because you have seen the first one. Well, opposed. you've seen Tom Holland's Spider-Man yes. pop up in the Avengers movies and in yeah. Captain America. And Civil I saw War. the first. What was the first one uh, called? Uh, Homecoming. Uh, home. Uh, They've all had yeah. home in the title, right? And then Homecoming, it was far from home, far from home, yeah. and then now No Way Home. Right. I don't know how it was a homecoming exactly in the first one, but well, it was like a meta thing on, of. Some homecoming story or no, something? No, not really that. Or... More of just like, oh, it was like a meta thing of like, Peter Parker is home at Marvel now. As a Wow, we really like, are yeah, living I mean, in a greed-obsessed, yeah, industry-obsessed society. I, that like It's yeah. almost like a pat on the back of like, oh, he's now under control That's, of Marvel. Uh, what like, do you expect from just a pat on the back? <laughs> you know, like, um, I can't, be- you know, I would say I can't believe that, but I actually can. It's like, you know, we've talked before about that's like the ending of Split, where it's like, yeah. oh, you've seen Unbreakable. Like, no, I haven't, <laughs> and I still have not. You craven a hole. Yeah. Like, as somebody who actually is mostly like Shyamalan in his films, I've seen is just like, <laughs> no, uh, I don't. Ca-. And it's like, oh, we have we have Spider Man now. It's like we don't care. Yeah. As in, we mean yeah. like the editorial. We no. So, uh, yeah, anyway. So, but well, was, I'm already starting this con- this part of the conversation pissed off, so you can only ag- imagine where it's going to go. Um, go ahead. But, it, and, okay, let's just maybe start off. What are our impressions of Tom Holland as Peter Parker and or Spider-Man? He's perfectly good. Yeah. Perfectly fine. No issue with him. Yeah, he's good, yeah. I think. And uh, I think what's weird is about his movies, though, his three standalone movies, and this is part of the problem with bringing Spider-Man actually into the fold of the Avengers and into the larger Marvel universe, is how busy they are. There's too much going on. The first one had like Iron Man was like now his mentor or whatever. Uh, and then Happy kind Hogan's of, there. Yeah, and is like his Alfred of sorts, you know. Uh, and then you got and Doctor then, Strange, and, and then in it's this just like one. a regular old you know John Hughes movie on top of that. You know, it, it's yeah. And then it's know. the whole thing of. Uh, now, this was actually the result of the uh, Civil War in the comic. This is actually playing on some of the Civil War stuff in the comics where Spider-Man's... Re- this was like in the mid-2000s when this happened. Spider-Man's identity was revealed to the public and Peter Parker is Spider-Man. Yeah. and uh, Like what they had done with, with Iron, Iron Man. Man. Yes. He's going all the way back to the original Iron Man movie. Um, and so it's doing a whole thing and Mephitso was the character in the comics that was the Doctor Strange role where he's like... I'm going to wipe away people knowing that you're Peter Parker and whatever, and and then all this hell is kind of yeah. breaks loose as a result of messing with the timelines. It's um, like real, I wish I had never been born, insert lightning strike and thunder rumble. Right. Like wind chimes in liar liar moment. Yeah. You know. Uh, but as someone who didn't yeah. see, you, now you saw again Homecoming. Yeah. You didn't did not see, see Far, far from, from Home. Home. And you haven't seen Doctor Strange at all. No. Which that kind of, this is, this is another thing too. It's just like, a lot of people wanted 
you know, Spider-Man to be in the Marvel Universe, but what happens is that just means you're pulling in all these characters as opposed to making focused series, serialized stories, maybe within the little Spider-Man pocket of things, but now you're blowing it up, and so it's now just getting even more yeah, complicated. Yeah, because, like, obviously this is a complicated situation, too, but it's like the Matt Reeves Batman movie does not have anything to do with what's... And the same thing happened with Joker, you know. Yeah. And I think that what, you know, what DC has actually realized, thankfully, is, and with this Suicide Squad movie, too, I guess... That because that is that technically part of this stuff um, or okay so the Suicide Squad movies are still in the realm of the Snyder Justice League. Well, I know the uh, first movies. one was. I'm talking about the new. I one. think the new one's even like it's kind of like a soft reboot, but I think it is kind of basically a sequel to but the original. But it kind of just changes things up okay. and like recast some people. Oh, okay, and you know whatever. But almost it, like what the Burton the Schumacher Batman movies. Oh, were, okay, almost, and along those lines. Okay. I think. Oh, so we're operating sense. on that simple of an idea. Okay, yeah. like because oh, remember when that was just like this is just what we're gonna do, and it's like okay, I'll do that. Yeah, but I could be wrong about that because uh, I've not I seen the new yeah. Suicide yeah, Squad movie. Really, nor do I frankly really care. I don't to, but. care. But anyways, with a lot of these DC movies, they finally realize they can't eclipse Marvel. So what they're rightly doing, at least conceptually, I don't yeah. know if they're doing it well. Uh, they didn't with Joker, but uh, and I don't know about this and Batman. We've yet to see the Batman. And then the Flash movies. Um, and the Fla- be, but yeah, that's gonna be different. They're doing the- these. Okay, let's just do one shot of that because mm-hmm. that's what people really want to see. Ultimately, because. You know, what was so genius about Marvel is that, and it's ambitious, is that, and I think it was right to do this with Marvel and not with DC, uh, because of all the multiverse stuff, even though they had the crisis on Infinite. They've done that with DC, I get it. But and, uh, it works better with Marvel to do the big, like, universe and have a big story rather than DC, in my opinion. But, well, it's you know. it's ironic because in the comics, DC plays with the multiverse concepts far more than Marvel even does. No, oh, do they? Okay. Um, uh, but the movies, the Marvel movies, are, are so advanced to this point where that's where they're already going off in that direction. And Doctor Strange is kind of opening up the realms of the multiverse with his powers, yeah. basically. So much so that we see the return of Alfred Molina's Doc Ock, of course, from Sam Raimi's 2004 Spider-Man 2, what was your kind of thoughts? Seeing? Now, a lot of people who haven't even seen the trailer have seen that he's going to be in this. What are your thoughts bringing him into this? Well, and supposedly there's a big list of all these other people. It basically, everybody is in either uh, No Way Home, No no Way Out, no, way out, no whatever the heck it yeah. is. Or Knives Out 2. So, like, those are the but only movies that have speak, anybody uh, in. for each other when oh, we say I'd which way, one we'd oh, rather, rather oh, see. Oh, I'd way rather see Knives Out 2. Yeah. Um, even though that, I'd be like, yeah, I'll go see it, whatever, yeah. and move on. Um, like I did with the first movie. Um, the fact but, that you'd say that's your reaction to going that and uh, still way more oh, yeah, than yeah. what like, this is yeah. speaks to well, what this is, you yeah. know. Um, but... I mean, well, you know, Alfred Molina recently was in Promising Young Woman in one of the most interesting performances I've oh, seen yeah. in a while. One scene that. performance, yeah. essentially, yeah. that I was like, he's probably the best thing about that movie, randomly. He's only in one scene. Yeah. It's just like, wow, okay. Um, I mean, he's great in everything. I mean, I give. I give, yeah. you know. In, in well, Man. he's frequently um, one but, of the most praised elements know. of the Raimi yes. Spider-Man movies. Okay, uh, sure. Now, yeah. Spider-Man 2, this is very controversial, I know. Well, we actually care. prefer Spider Man One to Spider Man Two. It's I like Spider Man Two it's better than It's controversial to have an opinion. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I actually do well, like yeah. Spider Man Two a good amount. Uh, you like it? Now, I've never but, been all that into uh, it personally, but, but I, I like but it. But yeah. it is quite good, and compared to a lot of stuff now, it looks even oh, better yeah. with these oh, passing yeah. year. You know? No, I mean, and let me be clear: those first two are really good to great, and then Spider Man Three is an abomination. But even that is a movie. Yeah. You know, I mean like it made choices yeah. that I was like, okay, well that's stupid. Yeah. Um but you know, to make Thomas Jane Sandman be the murderer of, <laughs> of Uncle, ben. Uncle Ben was the dumbest thing ever. But at least it was a decision. But we actually still quote you know, here and there Thomas Jane from that movie. Like, what's an example? I don't want to hurt you. Oh, get that. Get out of yeah, here. Yeah, get right? out of here. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't remember off the top of my head. That's a pretty forgettable well, movie. Well, I but. will say, though, too, yeah. some of the effects at that time, the sand effects were oh, new yeah. and different yeah. and felt A big. la uh, Arnold Vosloo effects in The Mummy. Right. But, 
Um, but, but so they're bringing so him yes. back. Uh, he was I mean, great in Spider Man Two. Yeah, it's but, but it's yeah. also like there's also a lot of rumors that Tobey Maguire and or Andrew Garfield are going to be multiverse versions of Spider Man who come into this uh, new thing. Also, Sam Raimi is directing the next Doctor Strange movie. So see, time is a flat circle, you know. Yeah, uh, I mean it's stupid. I mean. <laughs> I don't know what else to say about it other than, like, you know, you know I, I said this in my review of Halloween, the newest Halloween, which I was actually randomly kind of praising a couple weeks ago, somewhat. I mean, yeah. it's a good movie enough, fine enough. But, like, what, what I said in that review, I would say here, it's like, uh, in fact, let me just go find that really quickly, um, where the points add up, as we know. Yeah. Um... <laughs> I've still yet to see the newest Halloween. I might actually go and watch it before the new one yeah, comes Yeah, because out I'm going to go see the new one. Um, I said, it was towards the end of that, I said, sure, everyone seems to be having a good time here, but what's really the point in the first place? If Halloween is any indication of how star filmmakers and audience alike are for trips down memory lane, then Blu-rays and YouTube will soon be non-existent. Um, basically, what I'm saying in that is like, so we're just going to keep, oh, you remember when... Alfred Molina was in a movie? Yeah, I do. It was good. This isn't. Like, I could care less. I mean, you know, I I mean, let's just put in what Orson Welles, who we're going to be talking about a little bit later, uh, said about this whole idea of the homage. The most detestable habit in all modern cinema is the homage. L'habitude la plus détestable dans le cinéma moderne, c'est la notion d'hommage. I don't want to see another goddamn homage in anybody's movie. Je There are enough of them which are unconscious. This is becoming a recurring segment of the show, which I wholeheartedly, uh, yeah. you know, because we've dropped this at least once already. Oh, have and we? And we'll continue okay. to probably be remember. dropping it. But yeah. frankly, we need reminders here and there, yeah. you know? I mean, uh... It's time to take out the trash. I don't know. I mean, we are living in <laughs> bankrupt times, uh, spiritually, morally, uh, I mean, I, ethically, economically, politically, socially, uh, editorially. Yeah. I mean, like, everything about this is bad. And thankfully, I've seen a random amount of people reacting to this this way this week. Yeah. Uh, so I'm glad to know that there are people out there who are tired of just eating this garbage up and are fed up with it. But... You know, that's not most people, though, I gotta say. But I have been seeing yeah. a random amount of people that are the limited amount I was on Twitter this week. Yeah. Uh, I've been seeing some of it. But um, anyway. And two thoughts before we move on yeah. from this. One, we've already mentioned, I think, in the past, and go listen to our kind of remakes, reboots podcast. We talk about some of these elements already. Um, <sighs> that the new Flash movie is going to feature Michael Keaton returning as Batman. Um,. Now and we said that they're gonna get me to go see. Now, but the uh, but also let's like our cinematic solo introduction to the Flash. Okay. Yeah. Involves bringing back Michael Keaton as Batman. This just shows what you kind of respect how, for the character right. of the Flash. Well, does that, that just show? shows you very sadly the state that DC is in, where Batman is the only marketable character they have at all. Nobody cares about any other. Wonder Woman, I think, the, maybe. Yeah, has and, like and a, a, Superman, a little bit, who, would, who used to be the most marketable commodity in the world yeah. at, at certain points, mm -hmm. is no longer even. I know you know this, and mm -hmm. I don't have to tell you, but like, um, I don't know. That just doesn't make any but sense. But I just, to me. I mean, yeah. again, I love Michael Keaton as Batman. Anybody who knows me knows this is one of my yeah. defining character traits, okay? Yeah. Um, but what kind of respect does that show for, again, the character of the Flash? that you're not even letting him really kind of stand alone and do his own thing. It's got to bring back Michael Keaton as Batman. Um, and so, again, that is a version of let's just bring back Alfred Molina. And you know uh, what's sad and, uh, is Doc that Doc. when I was thinking about this a minute ago, I'll admit, I was like, wait, was it Spider-Man home, uh, nursing home, that <laughs> was it Spider-Man nursing home that he was going to be in as Batman? Because and then oh, I was like, was, uh, because he was the vulture. the vulture, and I was like, oh no, that he's going to be in the Flash movie. And then I just thought, what a screwed up situation we are in, where I'm even thinking, wait, was he going to be in that? Because yeah. he right. So you might be saying, well, you're just stupid, Levi. And I'm like, well, believe me, I don't think about this stuff often enough to even know that, which proves that I operate on a level higher than some people. So yeah. not to be like, you know. Uh, or I shouldn't say that. I should just say my mind is occupied with more important things. Yeah. But the last thing I wanted to say, I think yeah. I got, we went all over the place with this crap. Yeah. That I forgot to just say that 
you know, it was interesting at least, and I think it fit the character of Iron Man, a character who I despise, by the way, and don't really care for those that first movie, the only one of those I've seen. I mean, it's a good enough movie, but I just don't care. Um, Tony Stark uh, built the built, built this, this thing, thing in a cave co- with a box of scraps. I mean, you know, that's one of the things I remember. Yeah, Jeff Bridges uh, is bald. You don't see yeah, that often. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. You know a movie that's stupid is Tron Legacy. It is. Anyway. Um, but yes, moving back to... Digital uh, jazz. Digital man. jazz, man. <laughs> um, anyway, so like... Iron Man. It, Iron Man, yeah. So in that, it made sense. It fit the character for him to be like, I'm Iron Man. Come get me. You yeah. know, because he's such an egomaniac, you know. But like... To just be like, oh, everybody knows it's Spider-Man is Peter Parker now. It's just like, I know that they keep trying to turn his character into Iron Man. That's what they're trying to do, you yeah. know, to prolong this. But, I don't know, hopefully people are seeing the light. Uh, they aren't. But I'm just saying, hopefully that's the case and people will see through this commercial hell yeah. that we're living in. Mm-hmm. It's all it's all one big commercial, you know. Yeah. And, uh... That's all I have to say about that. And I just so. really wonder about people who just want to go, quote, see a Spider-Man movie. Yeah, you know, I just they, want to see Spider-Man. And they Spider-Man's generally movie. like, oh, yeah. I like Spider-Man, and I like the character of Peter Parker. And they kind of stumble into this, and they're like, what? Like, yeah. They're just like, what is any of this because talking about? Because like, people complain about the fact that we don't live in the monoculture anymore, or yeah. whatever. That's all that we live in. Because everybody watches the same stuff. That's it. You know. And even and people like, who normally you wouldn't consider a nerd or a, quote, yeah. geek are randomly above average literate on some of this Marvel stuff yeah. more and more, you know. And, like, I don't... And that's what I'm, ultimately what I'm saying by that is you're saying, yeah, what if somebody just wanted to go see that? And it's like, what about the people that we're losing to all this stuff? Not that I care. Yeah, go watch something other than a superhero movie, please. Anything. Like, mm-hmm. I could care less. Like, but at the same time... Like you're saying, it's like, what about the people who only care about one thing and they're so confused and are like, why does everything have to be part of one big thing? Why can't I just have this thing, you know? And that's what I'm saying is that a lot of people bemoan the fact we don't live in the monoculture. We clearly do because that's all that people talk about and that's all the culture cares about is this. Mm-hmm. So, therefore, that's a total lie, you know, start, yeah. like start actually paying attention to everybody because that's all that's happening. But anyway, go ahead. Um... And you hear a lot of um, people who are really into the comics, especially, talk about that Tom Holland is the, quote, most accurate comic version of Peter Parker as Spider-Man. Okay. Um, and I think there is something ironic about um, somebody who people genuinely think of as the best, quote, Spider-Man, and mm-hmm. then he's appearing in these movies that are so busy that they almost forget about him. As Spider-Man. As Spider-Man, and that they're, oh, Iron Man's here. Uh, multiverse, Avengers, Doctor Strange, and it's just like, what about Peter Parker and Spider-Man? Yeah. Now, one could say, well, they already told those stories in the original movies. Well, guess what? I guess I'll just go back and rewatch those then because I, I, I don't really care anything about any Well, of they this. say that all the time. They're like, we already did that. It's like, we've seen Batman's origin story like a million times now. Like, and there are uh, other yes, yeah. and there are other Batman stories you can tell that deeply get to the heart yeah. and the character of Bruce Wayne Without doing the origin yeah. story again at the same time, right. too. But that's on. So I don't want to hear this, this like flip flopping back and forth about. Well, people don't want to see the original same thing again, and it's like, well, but all you do is the same thing. It just gets too busy, and it masks itself as what it is: totally worthless entertainment that people will forget about once they leave. So that's it and, another, and anybody yeah. who would claim that they would remember it like to be honest I, f- I had forgotten a lot of things about Dawn of the Planet of the Apes and I love that movie but like I was like oh yeah I'd forgotten that you know why because I don't let it consume my entire life because I realize as good as this is it's only just a movie that is a you know blockbuster movie whatever I can move on and watch things that are more important and I say this as a massive Planet of the Apes fan. Obviously, we but, wouldn't be doing these right. all these movies and, if we didn't care. And in it's some way, like, yeah. but at the same time, some of these new ones have been less memorable to me because, well, first of all, they don't have. And we, we've kind of already talked about this. We'll talk about it again here today. They don't have exactly a visual dynamism about themselves, color wise. They all kind of look the same. They're not about humans. I mean, you know, so therefore you're like, oh, wasn't that the one where, no, I guess that didn't happen. You know what, honestly, one of the things that, uh, we're skipping ahead a little bit, but it's fine. 
the things that to me dawn and war is like one's got Gary Oldman and one's yeah. got Woody Harrelson. Right. That's like my defining yeah. features of remembering yeah. which is which, you know. And one is a little more urban, which right. is well, pretty much even way more urban yeah. than this one. Yeah. Because this one's all all in the wherever. But anyways. Yeah. So uh one last thing I was gonna say yeah. just about this and we'll move on is I think I had said in the past, both maybe on here, but also in conversations I can remember with people, that then you know, I've kind of jumped off the train of the Marvel movies and I kinda of did that at a point um where you know, after Endgame and Infinity War and all that, of like, okay, I feel like this is a time that I can kind of jump off because that all these movies loosely told a story, and I'm like, oh, you know what? I'll actually more often than not had fun with the Marvel movies. I've critiqued things about them, and they're not all good, but overall, I found it to be a good experience. But so long, that's yeah. it. I'm gonna get off the train now. And the one real test was going to be, what's the next Spider-Man movie going to be? Because Spider-Man, is, I love Spider-Man, you know, as a character in the comics. And um, those first two Raimi movies are really special in my heart. Um, but I was like, all right, what will be really the first Spider-Man movie after a lot of that? And what's it going? And then I saw this trailer and I'm like, oh, well, if this is what it's going to be, then maybe I'm safe staying on the sidelines. Yeah. Which part of me makes me sad, honestly, that we're about reaching the 20th anniversary of that first one. And it's gotten to the point now where this is where we are, but whatever. Speaking of tragedies, the story of uh, Princess Diana. A genuine tragedy. A genuine yes. tragedy. Mm-hmm. Um, the trailer was just released recently for Spencer, mm-hmm. which is Pablo Lorraine's pseudo-spiritual sequel, I guess, to Jackie, yeah, yeah. looking at Princess Diana, uh-huh. played by one of our great actresses, Kristen Stewart. Um we're actually in the midst, we've mentioned this in the yes. past, watching The Crown, um, and we're quite liking The Crown a lot. Um, and one really great thing about The Crown that I think we've talked about is that it's baked in skepticism of the monarchy. Yes. And it's mm-hmm. kind of... Which is really shocking And I feel like when the, mo- yeah. the movie, in a good or the, way. the show is talked about in the media and you see people post videos and screenshots of it or whatever it's like kind of like vaguely in a celebratory way yeah. towards the monarchy but the it's show like, itself margaret thatcher bows down to the queen <laughs> you know or whatever <laughs> but um, the show is and very... yes that was my voice if you're like wow i cannot believe that <laughs> like yes it was me anyway yeah um, but yeah but it, we're right. quite big fans of the show yeah. and um i can't remember the actress actually that plays princess diana on the oh show. Well, she's, she's great i can't remember her name either look she looks a lot like jodie foster actually but then she also does look a lot like um um uh, she's not an actress her, i've really seen no i don't think she's been much. in a whole lot um let's see because i, I want to acknowledge her name before yeah. we uh move on uh emma korean emma korean i believe okay mm-hmm. Um, plays Diana. Yeah, yeah. Princess Diana. Um, and that, uh, I know one thing too is special watching that show with our mom because yes. mm-hmm. she especially was I think taken it by Princess Diana. She's probably only a few years older than her. I think would would have been well yeah. a little bit older well, than her. Oh, yes, but as a blonde haired blue eyed woman, I couldn't. I haven't really, even really had some deep conversations about this with her. I'd be interested to sees a certain well, ideal yes. of adulthood. And I Princess remember at that time. Diana really took over the culture. Um, you know, here in, in America, yes. even, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, in the uh, 80s. And that's what I wanted to say, first of all, about the the crown, really watching that. And I've been actually pretty deeply affected, I must say, by her uh, story on this season four of the show. And, uh, and really thinking about, like, this might sound hyperbolic, uh, but I feel like all of the story of this whole story is ultimately her story. I don't, I don't say it just be oh her story, you know, yeah. but a lot of history, you know, that whole yeah. joke. But um, that I feel like really the story of the crown as of the whole show is ultimately actually the story of Diana Spencer and of someone how, brought into yes, this world and how yeah. the the royalty uh corrupted, erodes humanity yeah, yeah. and destroys well, corrupted uh, her, yeah, but like destroyed ro- her yeah. and uh, destroys lives. Um, and and the kind of the, uh, yeah. also the melancholy of the people who are at that place yeah. that society tells us should be happy and, and certainly are privileged and are yeah. very definitely uh, protected from a lot of the horrors of the world and oftentimes make decisions that adversely impact others. But 
still reckons with the fact that they themselves are human yeah and do feel a sense of melancholy about yeah. themselves um so we're, we're, again we were watching the trailer yeah. and it felt very crown esque no because I, I mean there were literally shots of what would have been buckingham palace and i was literally like the crown yeah. i said out loud um, I was like, yeah and this is a very brief teaser trailer yeah um and it's the kind way of trailers like, oh, should be you know, the way yeah. trailers should be um because it's just like I want to see that. Not like, oh, way is, uh, uh, you know, Solomon Solomon Electronic in this movie, you know? Like, I, I, like, I could care, you know, whatever. Um, but, <laughs> sorry, I had to, I had to bring I'm up Magnolia imagine, again. I'm imagine, like, his like, character, br- yeah. like, that exact character yeah. being in the world of this Pablo Lorraine, right. yeah. <laughs> like, Princess Diana movie, just like, what that would be yeah. like. But, yeah, it, it's the perfect trailer, and then it's literally just like, I want to see that. And Kristen Stewart looks a lot mm-hmm. like yeah. Princess Diana. I know Elizabeth Debicki's going to be playing her on the new, the new season, season, of, season of The five Crown. Of the Crown yeah. um, With Dominic West as uh, as Charles was just funny to me. But if you know either one of us, you also know we're huge fans of Jackie, which yes. is probably um, Lorraine, his most recent film that before that. That is probably one of the movies of the last six years, because it was 2015 when it came out, that I have watched as many times as I have because I find it to be... A, like bottomlessly, endlessly um, moving and interesting and spiritual. fascinating and spiritual. Yeah, we were just talking about John Hurt in his role in that movie again the other day. Yeah, which we do a lot anyway. I think that that um, was there was and, a tweet going around of his performance in that movie yeah. based out of the the tra- dropping of yes, this trailer. Right. Yeah, it was, and uh, um, I already love everything about this movie. Yeah. I'll be interested to see. You know what's what interesting is, is, and, is that and, yeah. I, I also, if you've not seen the poster, go look up the poster. I think yeah. the poster is one of the best like posters I've seen in recent memory. And, and yeah. almost like don't want the movie to come out because yeah. the poster itself conveys the message of the movie. Mm-hmm. And in a single instant, you act, absolutely get what the point of this endeavor is yeah. supposed to be. Yeah, and um, as, some, as a uh, known hater of movie trailers, I'm also not... Um, even more of not of a fan of posters, which I find to be oftentimes uh, posters are sloppy and te- not... typically garbage. This is an amazing po- but there's one of those things where I either hate a poster or lo- love or hate a poster. Usually, it's like it's either one. Uh, there are some that are in the middle, but like, uh, but that is a poster. I think that, like you said, it itself almost should just be a painting. Yeah, called Diana Spencer. Yeah, of what, or whatever. Like that should just be something in itself that conveys everything about that woman sadly yeah and her and her life uh in an instant um and uh yeah it is interesting know. too it's, the divide yeah. between this and jackie is that jackie principally takes place following this yeah. grand tragedy and the aftermath of that slightly looking back on what just happened yeah this is a movie that like is kind of projecting what we know of her future a little bit even though in an earlier moment in her yeah. life than what her, the end of her life was. So right. it is kind of playing with a little bit more dramatic irony, I feel like, in that way, in the sense of, like, it's earlier and we know what happens to her. And I don't even know how much this movie yeah, even I covers. Know. I don't know if it's, like, yeah. covers from when she kind of became part of the monarchy to her the end of her life. Yeah. Or if it's just, like, a time cap, like a, a yeah, bottle know. of just yeah. a little bit. I'm not quite sure. Um, but... One of the most anticipated movies, I think, of yeah. the, the fall. Yeah, so. definitely. And another movie that has a lot of anticipation and a lot of hype behind it is The Many Saints of Newark, which is, a, uh, I think if you see the poster, it says, The Many Saints of Newark, A Soprano Story. So we have yeah. a Star Wars story. we got Solo a Star Wars story. Now we got Many Saints of Newark, A Soprano Story. Yeah. Frankly, so, I, I am absolutely shocked that David Chase would actually go back in some yeah. ways and do this. Because he's somebody that has shot down rumors over the years and had zero interest and in maybe act as though he doesn't have any interest in returning to the world of the Sopranos. He just seems, and I say this with somebody who loves him and respects him, kind of a curmudgeon guy yeah. who wants to be done with it and move on. Well, I would imagine myself to be that kind of person if yeah. I was in those shoes. Well, um, and I think you know the answer to why he's, why I think, why I would assume you'd think he's doing this too, is that it seems that he wants to tell a story about the Newark race rights yeah and that ultimately the only way sadly that he can get that story told is to make a sopranos 
connection. Yeah, and I think and he does find. Some, I've I've seen an interview with him recently of Alan Seppenwald, which is about thirty five minutes long. I'd recommend people go watch it because it sheds some light into some of the the backstory yeah. and the process behind this. It seems like he's actually genuinely interested in exploring some of the characters before yeah, they were who they that. were in yeah. the Sopranos. Let's just say here, right here, right now, we're huge fans of the yeah. Sopranos show. Love the show. I think, frankly, the trailer. I want the trailer to be more of its own thing, and to kind of not try to tread too much on the Soprano. Like almost just be this really cool little late sixties, early seventies gangster story that involves this historical incident of the Newark race riots, which I frankly didn't know all that much about. Yeah. I read about in Nixon Land and was shocked by some of the numbers of people killed in that and how bad that actually really was. And it was kind of papered I've kind over. Of, I've kind of barely um, heard of that. Certainly there, Watts, but, yeah. Detroit, Chicago, a lot of places got a lot more attention than that did. Yeah. But that was actually a very awful uh, racial uh, racial violence against African-Americans in the community of Newark. Yeah. Um, and I think I really want the movie to, again, be this kind of gangster story set in that than trying to be, there's Uncle June, played by Corey yeah. Stoll, and, like, there's... And Dickie you know, Maltesanti. Mick, Dickie and, Maltes- and there's Ray Liotta, who stay actually... Out, stay out of his life. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, <laughs> that is in the trailer. Uh, I know that, uh, according to um, David Chase, he actually was approached, was one of the first choices for Ralphie. In the original was run, the Sopranos, and he didn't do it or couldn't do it for whatever yeah. reason, and so he was talking about what a joy it was to now, bring him yeah. into the world of the now Sopranos. Now I'm trying to imagine Ray Liotta and um, James Gandolfini fighting over him eating beef and sausage by the Blank and Carload, as yeah. we know. Um, but that that would have yeah. been interesting. But I think yeah. um, no, no, Pantoliano, Pantoliano was so was great choice. as Ralph. Well, now yeah. I'm imagining him though. I think what would the only way that would be more interesting is for Ray Liotta to play Ralph uh, like he does um, Trapman in um, yeah. Killing Them Softly, a very kind of wounded animal like kind of yeah, right. presence. I think that would have been interesting, but you couldn't sustain that for a whole TV show for like and, multiple seasons. Yeah. So but, in anyways. general, what did you think of the trailer? Uh, I think it's good. It I mean, maybe. more of what it excited me about it uh, because inherently the trailer is a little too much of what I think people think it will be and what I don't... And maybe it kind of yeah. could be, And maybe too. it will be that. I don't know. I hope not. And yeah. even still, I'll be fine with it because uh, who cares. Um, but I think it's going to be a little more of that, what we're saying, of more of the Newark race riots with a crime movie on top of it. Yeah. Uh, that has these characters in it. And, I mean, it's fine if it does that. I just don't want to see a bunch of, like, uh, he has his first dream. Yeah. He ha- you know, whatever would be the first of, and the, the Satrialis. Which uh, we see in the yeah, trailer. The first Santa Claus moment. You know, <laughs> stop blinking and interrupting. Oh, like, you know, or whatever. Um, But, you know, yeah, I don't want to, like, see that kind of thing. That's what really annoys me. That's why I couldn't watch that OJ people versus OJ show. Yeah, that because was very, that yeah. first episode was like the glove, the Bronco, the you know, and it's just like are the you knife, kidding yeah. me? It's like what you said apparently happens in the Chaplin movie. Now I've not seen yes. it, but I've been told that like there's moments in that where it's like oh he he puts on the hat and he does the first dance. Yeah, and, and it's, it's just, just like, like oh my god, yeah. like you know, it, Anyway, it's like, but um, speaking of our many disappointments of Robert Downey Jr. over the years, oh my God! Anyway, yeah, the uh, but yeah, so I'm sorry, I'm breathing heavily, yeah. like oh, Tony, Michael, uh, yes. Michael Soprano, his it son, should be said, or Michael, uh, Michael, Michael, Michael Gandolfini, his son, uh, <laughs> Michael who Soprano. we, we who we loved big, on the Deuce, big tone, Tony Soprano. Yeah, I think he was really great on the Deuce, and uh, no, he. His mannerisms are exact as far as being like Tony. It made us laugh when we saw the first trailer. Yeah. The first time I saw it because I was like, he literally is acting exactly like well, him. It was Sep- almost funny. Um, but, in the yeah. Seppenwall interview, Chase was saying that at the first table read, they had everybody there. Yeah. And he said he was just like, um, you know, they're just sitting down. They're yeah. not getting up and acting. But said he was just sitting there. And the way he had his shoulders and the way he was like, the mannerisms. He said it, he kind of he couldn't help but laugh because he says, "Oh wow, it's like." Was he acting that way normally, father. or no? What? No, he, he says that he was, on a little he was bit. like okay. yeah. embodying right. the character yeah. in that. Um, no, I mean he clearly is a really good actor already, but of the Deuce, and, and then he's also going to be in that 
Paul Thomas Anderson movie, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So No, no, that's um Philip Seymour Hoffman. Oh, son. I'm sorry. That's yeah. right. No, yeah. I was I couldn't remember. I was like, yeah, never mind. I can't remember his name, but that's Hoffman's son. No, because yeah. I was like, no, there was somebody else. Yeah. Anyway, but two yes, of our great uh, actors. Uh, yeah, that's no the thing. It's sad anymore. that it's like their sons are in movies now and they're not around anymore. But um, no, I mean, I think it's going to be a really a pretty. I'm I'm thinking it's going to be pretty good. I'm putting my I think it'll chips be good. out there and yeah. see it. if it's but, not, it also won't be the yeah. biggest thing. Well, also, another thing yeah. too is just that um. The Sopranos, the show that most people think it is, and I think a lot of people understand it's not just that, but a lot. Oh, it's a mob show. It's like, it's it's a crime show. And hey, few people love gangster and crime stuff more than me. Trust me. But the genius of that show was the Melfish scenes. And you know, I you know we've seen over the years here and there people like, oh, the Melfish scenes are on again. Like no, that's point. literally like, the, that's the whole, that's, that's what the, the show, show is. Yeah. The whole show is that. Like, yeah. and him and his family. That's really what the show's about. Like all this other mob stuff, that's important. But like, and him, that's and, what the whole especially show is. him and Christopher, that stuff's very, very important. But like, I mean, three most important relationships in his life collectively are like Melfi, yeah. his whole family, his immediate family, and Christopher. Like mm-hmm. those are the real tenets of the show. And so like, yeah, and, and you know, I think sometimes that gets glazed over. And I'll just say yeah. that this movie will inherently lack some of that stuff. Yeah, but, and I'm fine if it does, but that will be missing. Yeah. But that's fine. I understand well, that two too. thoughts. First of all, the best show or the best scene in that show, and maybe one of the best scenes in TV history, is that scene in season five where he is admitting the whole thing about what happened with his cousin Tony, played by uh, C. Bashimi, the night that he went down. Which I, I was thinking, by for, the way, I wonder if anybody's going to play a young Bashimi. Oh, I didn't this. think about that. I don't know Could if be. Is. Uh, but the, the night that he went to jail yeah. and got caught. Uh, and then he eventually got right, out, but he spent Tony, a long time That in. Tony had lied and said he had been like beaten up by these black guys or something and, went and said all this racist stuff about that. And, yeah. and that um, actually that was the first night he'd ever had a panic attack. And he felt and so embarrassed. And he didn't tell yeah. anybody about it. And the whole scene is him literally having a panic attack. Talking about it. While talking about it. Yeah. And that that's one of the... I mean, first of all, I think maybe the best performance of all time is him as Tony Soprano, maybe. It's I don't way, know. It's way up It's there. him or De Niro and Raging Bull, which is yeah. the most, like, y'all think, wow, like, bro opinions. But, yeah. I mean, come on. That's those true. are the two greatest performances yeah. of all time, in my opinion. But the... That is just one of the greatest scenes of act, moments of acting I've ever seen in anything. Is that scene? Secondly, I would hope, and this is about the many saints of Newark as a whole. I would hope that David Chase would realize the importance of coming back to this. I think he does, and yeah. knowing after having seen the new season of Twin Peaks: The Return, right. that he had best not just go back to the well. And do all that, do the whole thing over again. Yeah. And I would hope that he would know, as for his love of that, that he would recognize that's what he needs to do right. is do something a little bit. Apparently, different. Apparently, he wanted to know. even direct this movie, um, but he had some health crises in his family, and okay. he couldn't dedicate the time yeah. to direct it. So Alan Taylor, who directed yeah, a lot directed of the show, of it, he came in to do it. And yeah. So, so I don't know. I'm I'm putting up a lot of hope that this is going to be what I hope it will be, and if it like if it's not, whatever. Yeah, I mean, I mean again, I I hope it's good. I think it will be good. Yeah. Um, but all you know, but hey, guess what? This goes back to even talking about the Spider Man stuff. Are my Sopranos Blu rays just going to disappear off the shelf if it ain't good? No. I yeah. Just go back and watch those. And, yeah. And love all that, right? So ultimately. That's where we fall. Yeah. So again, that, that's just three out of a bunch. There's well, and especially with Spencer and the Many Saints of Newark, we'll very likely go see those and talk about those on Blue Plate Specials yeah. of the Future. Yeah. And you would be, uh, you would be right to think that we will very unlikely be seeing uh, Spider Man Nursing Home. So, <laughs> um, it, it is. Yeah. I, this isn't really an appeal to me, but it is interesting that this is actually the first Spider Man movie coming out at Christmas. Every other yeah. Spider Man movie's been. When I really remember those first ones, it's like they were big May releases. Those yeah. like first three, I remember. Yeah, uh, and then yeah I remember that. that. I remember going to see that in the, uh, the Hardy's tie-in. I remember going to see that up there at at the Lenore, Lenore Theater. Westgate, yeah. And we went, and it. I remember walking out. I think it was of the second one, mm-hmm. or the third one. I don't remember. 
and I just remember that experience of when that was. So anyway, I remember yeah. seeing that first one and um, reading. I had read the uh, junior novelization yeah. for, beforehand, and so I already knew what the movie was going to be. But like the first few scenes, I was like, "Oh wow, this is like exactly what the book is," or whatever. Yeah. And it's like, and I think part of me even thought it was based on that book. I didn't understand yeah, that they right. wrote it. Anyways, um, let's talk about movies that are great. Definitely great, right? Yeah. Not like maybe kind of great or maybe definitely great. We recently saw Touch of Evil, mm-hmm. which actually, you know, just last week we were talking about neo noirs and noir, yeah. and so we kind of covered some of that territory already. Yeah, um, so we won't return to that. We're too both much, big but... fans of Orson Welles. Yeah, everything about him. I mean, the more you learn about him, the more fascinating he gets. Yeah. Um, Touch of Evil was one of the biggest movies of his that we haven't seen yet. Yeah, uh, and it, it was kind of on our list for forever. Um, and speaking, you know, it's, it's actually fitting that we end the Planet of the Apes movies. Once again, bringing up Charlton Heston. In this case, he plays a Mexican. I don't know yeah. what's more ridiculous, him as an astronaut or him as a Mexican. Both are pretty equally um, hard to believe, frankly. Yeah. Um, what do you think of Touch of Evil? I think it's really good. I mean, uh, one thing I appreciated about it is it made sense. Um, and as, as we talked about last week, a lot of noirs get lost yeah. in the plot, lost in the sauce, if right. you will. Um, that one, not so much. And that uh, it's just really well made. What I really like, I said this in my review of it, it's weird because you can tell it's very much influenced. At first, you think, "Oh, this is," very, and it, and I think it is. I don't want to just totally say it isn't, but you think, "Oh, this is pretty influenced by you know a lot of uh, European art cinema of the time." And then you just remember, "Oh no, it's just Orson Welles who's making this." Well, and, Orson Welles, like, anyways, influenced. Right. That's a lot what I'm of saying. That, so you're yeah. like, "Oh no, actually, it's just him doing it." But that he had spent most of the '50s and actually the late '40s in Europe making movies, um, yeah. and uh, that him finally coming back and doing that and then it wasn't well received and we watched the like 1998 version which was like more of what he wanted or something i don't know but the other version supposed yeah, the theatrical version was supposedly not exactly what he wanted to do yeah. or something i don't know and he, and he drafted um, like a 50 some page memo to the studio and that this again in 98 he was dead by that point yeah but it was kind of reassembled on the behalf of his so it is Obstensibly a director's cut, but not totally exactly. Well, because, supposedly like what happened I mean, with the other side yeah. of the win, which who knows if he would have liked the way that was right. either. I don't know. He probably wouldn't have liked it just because he knew that Bogdanovich had helped. Yeah. So you know, but um, but that movie's great too. Oh yeah. Uh, no, it is. Fact, you know. uh, and there's people who think it isn't, and they're just wrong. So whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. I just think it's really good. It, it's uh, one problem I have with it though. Touch of Evil is that by the end. Now, I don't think this is really spoiling anything, but basically, at the end, when Orson Welles' character is essentially... Well, the whole thing's about, so, this explosion happens, this car bomb blows... That's like the beginning of the movie. Mm-hmm. This car bomb blows up. Uh, Charlton Heston's character is this Mexican uh, police or detective. Don't or ask us why. I don't know. Um and, the, and by the way, I want to say, I thought his performance actually pretty good. No, I mean, good, he wasn't but, bad in yeah, the movie. But, he just shouldn't have even been playing the character no, to begin with. But yeah, I, yeah. I agree, he wasn't yeah. bad. But really. um, but anyway, and uh, so he's kind of looking into it, but then it's like, oh, well, the people on the American side of the border, because it like goes from the Mexican border yeah. to the American border, and like the cops there are investigating it, and the kind of lead detective is, uh, you know, Orson Welles, and he's... Uh, very uh, unflattering performance on. Oh yeah, like, one of the most vanity free performances. I'm, which it should uh, be said, in a lot of his movies, even going back to Citizen Kane, which is a big unveiling for him. Yeah, I mean Kane, he's not a great character, yeah. great guy. His character in The Stranger really isn't. I mean, he's not afraid to cast himself in unlikable yeah. parts, which right. I appreciate. And uh, anyway, that that character basically makes these assumptions about who committed the crime, and then plants evidence on those people, more or less. And that by the end of the movie, all I'll say is that, yeah, his suspicions were proven right, but the whole point is, like, but he's not a good guy. But that isn't exactly what Wells chose to end it on. He said to be like, Marlena Dietrich's in the movie randomly, don't ask me why, but I guess she's a great actress, I guess that's why. Um, but she's talking to randomly the guy who was the police cop, the, like, motorcycle cop in Psycho mm-hmm. was who that guy was, randomly. And they're like, man, who was he and like, I don't know. He was a good. He was a good guy. You know, he was a, he was a good enough guy. You know, and I'm like, no. He consistently proved he wasn't the whole movie. But whatever. just because he was quote right, yeah, about who committed this I murder, felt like that, I mean, all yeah. the times he was uh, 
you know, cutting corners and planting evidence and doing all kinds of awful, unethical things. You know? right, but we loved him. It's like, why? <laughs> you know, I, I, and so that was the biggest So you think problem. the movie itself was kind of giving him a little bit of an out and yeah, saying, because hey, the maybe whole movie, the whole bad. point of the movie was what Heston was saying was that, well, that's not right. That's not the court of law. And he's like, well, whatever. I'm, I'm a big fat guy and I'll do what I want. You know, <laughs> that was his... his uh, uh, yeah. Spoiler, his death, by the way, in that. The, a particular shot of him in the water. We were yeah, laughing at. it's just like, oh my God. It's literally <laughs> like a whale floating around out there. But yeah, I mean, that was the point of his, you know, where he was really... Well, it's actually, he was he put on a little more weight for that role than he even was at the time. Yeah, and but, even later on when yeah, he was a little no, bigger, he wasn't, he wasn't quite no, as big it, as it's, that. It's an exaggerated yeah. performance. But um, the, yeah, I'm just like, no, I don't buy any of that. And that kind of cheapened the movie to me a little bit because I was like, wait, so what do you think about this character? Like, I don't really understand. Also, He's clearly um, the villain. We really like, like Vivian Lee a lot. and her Janet and, Lee. Or Janet Lee, excuse mm-hmm. me, excuse me. Uh, Janet Lee a lot in the movie, yeah. and she kind of disappears and is not yeah, as much of a and, presence. And to... after she's been drugged, too, and I thought that was kind of like, she never even came, they just said, oh, she's okay, she was never seen in the movie again. Yeah. Like, and, uh, yeah, I don't know, whatever. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's overall a really good movie, but I had some yeah, issues I agree. with it. But, but, but like, I, what I really appreciated about was, Obviously, the atmosphere, like yeah. setting a noir at that particular moment on the border between U.S. and Mexico, yeah. it was very evocative. Yeah, um, it reminded me a lot of uh, um, the Third Man, as far as the way it created a uh, now totally different place, obviously. Yeah. Um, but Carol Reed, it reminded of course, me of that. Directed yeah. the Third Man, right. but Orson Welles was in it and mm-hmm. played a role in a lot. Joseph of Cotton movies. was also in this movie, uncredited. Yeah, which is random. But. Um. And another thing I also appreciated about it um, was randomly just its use of the rock and roll music at points, like of that yeah. contemporary rock and roll music, which uh, was of those uh, basically those like hoodlums, basically. Yeah. That they were the ooh the scary modern kids of the day. Like I thought yeah. that was kind of interesting to see. Um, quite a good movie, um, and again, yeah. kind of filled a random noir blind spot for yeah. us um, as well. So if you haven't seen Touch of Evil, go check it out. I think. There's a long time it was on Netflix. I don't know if yeah. it still is or not. Probably not. Uh, I'm not sure. Because if it's good, it ain't on there. We know that already. <laughs> there is some good stuff on there, but on the whole, not well, so much. Yeah. All right. We're ready now to move in to our last of the nine Planet of the Apes films with War for the Planet of the Apes. Um, so, Levi, why don't you kind of give us a brief overview of what this is about, and also we'll go again through the cast and crew. Alrighty, so, War for the Planet of the Apes is a 2017 American science fiction action film directed by Matt Reeves, produced by Dylan Clark, Rick Jaffa, and Amanda Silver, written by Mark Baumbach and Reeves. So, actually, Rick Jaffa and Amanda Silver didn't write this one, uh, but Baumbach came back, and Reeves also uh, was a co-writer. So, in this one, um, we pick up two years after the fact of the last film of Dawn. Um, and they've only, and the apes have only furthered, you know, entrenched themselves kind of into the woods and aren't coming out anytime soon. Um, and that basically the movie follows a kind of large confrontation between uh, the apes and the humans uh, for control of Earth. There's a kind of a battle that opens the movie. Um, and uh, the their leader, the human leader, played by Woody Harrelson, only known as the Colonel, um, Kills. I mean, you want, I think maybe the third most iconic colonel after Kurtz and Sanders, I think. Or what about the colonel in Boogie Nights? You think he's fourth? Yeah, maybe. I mean, you know, he probably would be higher, but considering some of the things he does, you know, then maybe he get, he gets a few. Yeah, I think drops. all these people are not all that great. So that we're talking. You know, about, what's but. ironic is Colonel Sanders is probably the best morally out of yeah, all those. Right. It's like, well, I guess he made a bunch of fried chicken. Yeah. Probably gave a lot of people heart disease and killed them. But yeah. that's still better than some of the others. But and you know, probably had ideas that weren't politically correct. I don't know. But yeah. um, anyway, um, so yeah, and the uh, the Woody Harrelson character kills um Caesar's son, uh, Bright Eyes. I'm guessing, or not, or what was his name? Not Bright Eyes. Um, these eyes, these eyes are crying. These eyes have seen a lot of love, but they're never gonna see all the love I'm gonna have with you. These eyes are crying. These eyes, okay. Uh, blue eyes. There we go. <laughs> anyway, um, 
<laughs> so, uh, he gets killed. And uh, then uh, Caesar's like, all right, I'm going to go get revenge. And that's most of the movie is him kind of traveling around. He kind of picks up some other apes along the way. Um, and it all ends in one big bloody battle, uh, one big war for that planet. And, and that's uh, so interesting yeah. that the end of the original five films uh, was called Battle. Yeah. This one's War. It's like, well, and it's literally like they're like running out of ideas both times. It was like, Big Battle yeah. happens. You know, now, this one, been... unfortunately, didn't have Paul Williams. Yeah. Yes. Now, what I would have liked to have seen, though, for the, the by the way, for all these, uh, mainly I thought about this because of the, what the second movie was of Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. So why didn't they name them Night of the Planet of the Apes, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, and Day of the Planet of the Apes? Just to be like, you know. Or the opposite. Yeah. Day, night, or uh, what were they again you said? Uh, night, dawn, day. Maybe like day, night, dawn. Yeah. You know. Anyway. Kind of, I don't know. Better movies. They didn't pay us for it, yeah. so they didn't pay us to give ideas. So. But, you know. George Romero didn't do any of these. And we talked about that before. Exactly in this universe, uh, in this timeline. Well, maybe? this one mm-hmm. is two, 2028 is when this one takes place. Oh, seven years out. So it's two two years after uh, the Bonobo Coba, which is just hilarious. But yeah, so basically, uh, that's it as far as what the yeah you know deal is. Um, but essentially, the humans are further degraded. Uh, there seems to be. Also, it doesn't talk about it an awful lot, but some sort of uh, turf war going on between the the final humans that are alive yeah. and uh, that, that kind of... They've even the splintered end. off. Kind yeah, of, uh... and um, what's interesting really to me about the ending of the movie is that it shows the humans, the other humans show up, and they're never shown in full, like, they're just seen as like they all wear white. And yeah, they look like stormtroopers almost, or something. And it's weird because they're not seen almost as even being human beings. Mm-hmm. They're just like a force of people that we yeah. don't know anything about. It's interesting that yeah, there's never any information given about those people, and then they're spoiler, I guess, but they're quickly wiped out so, in the end. Um, so Matt so Reeves yeah. is back anyway. to direct. Yep, the um, second movie he's done of these. Mm-hmm. I've forgotten. We were, and we'll talk about some of the reviews here in a little bit. That by the time this was coming out, I think he had already been announced to do the Batman. They actually yeah, popped up in the right. Ringer review, so I'd forgotten that. So Matt Reeves is back, does a fine job directing the movie. Yeah. One thing we have forgotten about Matt Reeves and Andy Serkis, and we recently came across them, oh yeah, is that Andy Serkis is actually playing Alfred in the Batman. Yeah. yeah he's playing Alfred Pennyworth. Right. Frankly, I, I'm for any opportunity of Andy Serkis to not be in motion capture. Yeah. Because I think, I think he's a really good actor. Frankly, I'd like it to see him more... Of him, yeah, uh, that quote digital makeup that he referred to, uh, you know, right. Can move on from that, yeah. So, sir, you know, Caesar's back. Um, now, again, this kind of forces Caesar to finally really go after humanity yeah. because they kill. Yeah, his son. because th- that's it. I mean, that's the last straw. And like, like we've said, I think the point of these movies, if you go by as a like trilogy, is that the first one is him like, okay, well, we just want to be left alone. Right, and we want to be free. We want to get well. Loaded. It's also about we his want to betrayal, have a good time. right? Well, he's being basically a child of humanity, and then being betrayed by yes. humanity. And that, but even still, he's still like, okay, we just want to be free. We want to get loaded. We want to have a good time, you know. <laughs> but then the second one is a lot of tests about, okay, what what will humanity? What really can we do with humanity? And by the end of that, it's like, okay, well, we're just gonna leave them alone still. This one is a definitive breakdown of like, no, these people need to be destroyed. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, the, essentially that is ultimately what it has, is um, necessary, I guess. Right. Um, about this movie. Yeah. But anyway, so we want to go through the cast? Yeah. All right. Yeah, we might be going through this introduction a little quicker because, hey, we're, we're at the end. Yep. You know, we want to get through it. Yeah. So, Andy Circus is Caesar again. We covered that. Yeah. All I'll say is, I mean, obviously the uh, special effects look better, even more than... Yeah. They didn't apply. But the, the, the digital makeup's even better. Yeah. Yeah. As he would say. Um Woody Harrelson is Colonel J. Wesley McCulloch, the leader of the paramilitary organization, the Alpha Omega, who's obsessed with wiping out Caesar and his tribe to preserve humans as the dominant species on Earth. That seems I feel like his, you know, um let's just talk about Woody Harrelson yeah. first, I think. Have we talked about him on here before? Mm, I don't think so. Okay. 
Um, we will again. Woody Harrelson is probably one of our randomly great actors, actually, in America, yeah. subtly. Um, in terms of just the variety of things he's been in over a great many years. I've been slowly working my way through Cheers over the last nearly year now. And I'm only now really in season four where he was introduced. Yeah. And it's such a radically different Woody Harrelson than the one yeah. I'm used to in terms of being a darker presence in movies. Um, I know one of the first movies I always think of of Woody Harrelson in is No Country for Old Men. Yeah. And he doesn't have the biggest role in that, but a very memorable role. Woody Harrelson, again, classic, consummate pro in Hollywood. He knows what he does well. He shows up, and he usually does it. And that's kind of, again, he's a... He's a character, frankly, I could see it being a lot more westerns, yeah, and be good as an older guy now. Um, it's so much. I mean, he his character in No Country for Old Men feels like a western character, a western archetype. But even him in, like, say, True Detective, which I think he was very memorable yeah, as, you know, right. being uh, paired with uh, his good friend Matthew McConaughey. Um, I randomly think about him in Triple Nine a lot, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, that has, and spoiler for that movie, if you don't want to know, that the ending of that movie is him, like, with, he's been shot at some point right. earlier on. Yeah. Him with his tie hanging over the, like, the, like, rearview uh, mirror. Rear mirror, and he's like, I got you, basically, and, like, kills the person. And then the final shot of the movie is him just, like, dying. Yeah. And this is like, what? And it's kind of it's like the ending of uh, Kings of New York. Or King of New York. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. I think I've mentioned this movie in the past, but he's really great in the movie Rampart. Um, yeah, you told me about and, that. Uh, right? yeah, it like plays Dirtbag Cop to end all Dirtbag yeah, Cops. Right. Now. He's really great, actually, in that movie. And that movie's actually really good and underrated. Um, any other thoughts on Woody Harrelson? Uh, not really. I think, I mean, one of his best great performances, I think, is in Natural Born Killers. Yeah. Um, I just always want to bring that up because that's a duo of performances and normally we're not the biggest uh, uh Juliette Lewis fans in the world necessarily but I think she's really great in that and uh that's just uh, that's a movie I quite I mean like, her passion but, for Britney Spears is something yeah. that I keep at the forefront right. of my Can mind. we be saved? Let's just you know what right here we'll give a little bit of a, a little bit of a taste of that. Can you save us Britney Spears? Can we be saved? God, why is Satan controlling the universe? Have we played that on here before? I don't think we have. Well, there you go. Yeah. So. Our inaugural moment. Yeah. Yeah, Woody Helson's good. In this, you know, of course, he's trying to be the kind of uh, Marlon Brando performance in Apocalypse Every, Now. I want to talk about this. Every review we read mentioned apocalypse now as an influence on this yeah. movie well the, and the movie makes it clear that's no it what does it i mean it's not so, yeah. trying to hide that um no. but I, I, most of the movie I'm, I'm surprised it even gives him a full name on the wikipedia page because i only ever really remember him referred to as the colonel in the movie yeah um and i guess you know he plays a role similar to gary oldman's role in the last one yeah but even far less sympathetic than i feel like oldman yeah. was well like i said in in that last one oldman was kind of like a uh you know, like a, like Peter Fonda in The Limey. Yeah. Like a villain that is totally unprepared to deal with situations yeah. they have to. Yeah. You know, it's like, and, and there's a sympathy that can be given there. And this, I mean, he literally by the end becomes a literal mongrel human being. I mean, as the, oh, the LZ, whatever, medicine yeah. goes, goes, gets even worse and he's further degraded. Yeah. Um, and I feel like there's a thing in this movie in there about old pictures of his son or something. I but remember, like, but we got that already with Oldman. You know what right, I mean? Right. Maybe I'm misremembering. I think that. that's such a beautiful moment, really, and I'd forgotten it in the last one. Yeah. When they finally get the power back on, and the first thing he does is like, yeah. his well, iPad starts human charging, being. and yeah. him just breaking down, looking at And that was really, I forgot about that. I was like, oh, that's a very moving moment. And I think that that. And expresses in a scene. Yeah. Why he would do anything right. that he's doing. And also I mean? that there there isn't really so much different between the apes and he. Yeah. As far as that, there's that, and then there's the whole thing with uh, Caesar and his son and wife and all that, yeah. that I feel like that, yeah, I feel like that works really well to do that. And that in this movie, it just feels a lot more, um, the humans are definitively just evil at this point. Yeah. And there's not a whole lot um that is left it's more to simplistic be, yeah now of course though it should be said there's that uh little girl 
yeah. um, that they're taking care of. We'll talk year. about in a minute. Yeah, but uh, is yeah. she called Nova or yes. like? Yeah, she is. Yeah. yeah. Well, we'll talk about that like in a minute. But yeah. yes. So uh, Steve Zahn as Bad Eight. Uh, I didn't know he was him in this. Yeah. Um, he's kind of a famous actor comedian. He'd been big yeah. in the nineties. Isn't especially. he in that new White Lotus show? Yeah, I think he is. Yeah. I remember him a lot from. Uh, I believe he's in um, Reality Bites. Yeah, he plays kind of a character. Yeah, and that. Uh, that thing you do out of sight. Uh, Stuart riding Little. in a car with boys. <laughs> Stuart Little and Stuart Little too. Yeah, rescue um, Dom. Dire Dire. Wimpy. Oh, yeah, he's the dad in the Dire of a Wimpy Kid movies. I forgot about that. It's always so strange when I noticed this more historically than I've seen it over the course of my own life, but I even started to see it, is when a guy who's a youngerish guy starts to play the, quote, dad roles in movies. Yeah. And it's just like, oh, I remember when you were in Reality Bites or like a younger person or whatever. Uh, yeah. And right. He's kind of the comedic uh, foil or the kind of the comic relief in this movie. Right. I remember Bad yeah. Ape is. Yeah, And yeah. frankly, it's something that, like, is so welcome. You're like, oh, we could have kind of used a little bit yeah. more of this. I actually two. like it. I mean, I think there's a lot of people that wouldn't. But I actually like it because I think it's interesting to see an ape that is actually even more advanced, seemingly, thought-wise, yeah. than Some the others. others. Yeah. And um, that he... But he's also, you know, not even low-key, just kind of insane yeah. at the same point in that... Uh, it's weird. I feel like it's like if you took the Dennis Hopper role in Apocalypse Now, made him on the good side in quotes, mm -hmm. and not and more yeah. in the movie, but less like overtly crazy. And you've got the, this is the That's performance. That's a lot of qualifiers. You know what I mean? Yeah, though? Yeah. It's like it reminds yeah. me of that type of yeah I, role I in the movie. That. It's very strange. Yeah. I never thought about that till now. But um, and I think that um, also the thing I like about it, it reminds me of uh. Somebody in our family randomly of uh, our great uncle Arnold who's oh. passed on. That sounds like an <laughs> insult, and I don't mean it that way. Yeah. But I just think he kind of looks like him yeah. weirdly. I know he's a an ape, but like, uh, and he just reminds me. I never me thought of him. about that. Before, and that always and that, that sounds like I'm being like demeaning in some no. way, and I'm not. But that makes me like to watch him right. because it reminds, it reminds me of you. him. Yeah. Okay. So I never thought and about that. Before. Not even and also not even just the way he looks, the way he acts and talks reminds me kind of of the way he would kind of pick at, pick us at and you, and you, yeah. it's a very specific thing that if you just knew who he was, you'd get it. But okay. anyway, it, it, anyway, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, Toby Cable is Koba only like in what, dreams, like dreams or and ghosts, whatever. whatever. Yeah. Gabriel Chavaria, I just moved on immediately from that. Gabriel Chavaria as preacher or crossbowman working under the colonel in the Alpha Omega. He's kind of like one of the main human characters in the movie, of which there are like two. Yeah. Um, but he's that guy that gets captured at the beginning of the movie and then gets let go, mm -hmm. um, by the apes. Um, and that he, um, basically comes back at the end and is like, no, I will try to kill you, and then it don't work out yeah. for him. Uh, he's, I mean, he's good enough. You know, the problem with this movie, in a, in a sense, is that there aren't enough human characters. But, yeah. You know, whatever. Um, Judy Greer is Cornelia, back again. I don't really remember her a whole lot in the movie as much. Uh, yeah. And um, yet again, in some of the reviews we were reading, yet again drew attention to the fact that not a lot for females or yeah. female apes to do. So that yeah. is yet another problem um, in here. Yeah. And again, ironically, now that I think back, other than like Zira in the original movie, that like Helena Bottom Carter's ape in the Burton movie was frankly one of the most dynamic female characters in all yeah. these movies. It's And it came yeah. in that very subpar mm -hmm. movie, you know. That's yep. just yeah. unfortunate for this franchise, but... Karen Carnival is Maurice back again. Um, Maurice is in this movie quite a bit, it seems like, yeah. to, in memory. Um, I remember he's at the kind of final moments in particular. and uh, Of course, he's very much like that Zayas role. It seems like he, I think, more than any other ape, um, recognizes the importance of a legacy Um for the apes and and a kind of a historian of ape the growing ape culture yeah um because we saw in the last movie that he was you know trying to teach the apes to learn how to read 
And I, he's very much really kind of the most important of the group in a way because he will live on afterwards. Spoiler, I in guess. Many ways, but, like, in many ways, like, setting the uh, standard for, like, um, you know, the the orangutans we see right, in the yeah. original films right. in terms of them Although, being the, like, yes. wi- men of wisdom and the men of knowledge. So, in many and, ways, he probably is representative of the lawgiver, ultimately. Yeah. Um, in many ways. Yeah. Um, which I'm always confused of. Is the lawgiver Caesar or that's something I've never really right. understood? Yeah, but it doesn't really matter. Um, anyway, yeah, I mean, good. I mean, it's hard to be like you know, Karen kind of all good job. I guess I don't know. Didn't see you. Didn't see you there. Yeah. I don't know. You know. Um, but Terry Notary as Rocket, Caesar's loyal lieutenant. Back again. That guy. Okay. He's in Avatar. Um, yeah, I mean... It probably was CGI to, to watch him yeah. in that, too. Um, we just got a bunch of other names. Just a bunch of random yeah. people here. Uh, and then, uh, Amia Miller is Nova, a mute orphan girl, um, who Maurice befriends and cares for. So, she in the movie is found at one point, and she can't speak at all. Yeah. Um, and, uh, she randomly gets her name because there's, like, an old Chevy Nova yeah. car emblem that yeah. she's holding on to or something. Um, and it's it, one the one, and she, I mean, she's pretty good in the movie, I guess, yeah. you know, but that she, I think is interesting to represent how weird of a party that they've got yeah. going on because it's like Caesar and Maurice, obviously, and a couple other yeah, apes. apes. And then you've got like her, who's like a human who can't speak. Yeah. A uh, little girl. And then you've got the, uh, bad ape. Yeah. Who's like, an ape that can speak even more and it's kind of weird and it's and like I, a one, one really the, weird kind of group. One of the biggest things I remember of, about going back to the bad ape is that he's like, isn't he wearing like human clothes yeah, like through yeah. most of the movie? Because, and just, because at the, his first moment in it, he's riding around on a horse and like you can't see if it's a human or yeah. not and you're like, oh, he's wearing human clothes. Yeah. like, But yeah, so anyway. So that's getting us yeah. more in the realm if you want to say it of the original movies in terms of seeing the apes of the future with human clothing on or clothing of any sort. Um, but yeah, what was the box office for this? It was $150 million. It made, and it was, uh, made for 490.7 million. Is it, uh, the opposite of that? Or no, I'm sorry. It's budget. Yes. Was made for 150 million. It made, 490.7. That's actually a decent drop off from what the second movie was. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was a longer movie and I think people just didn't, didn't care very much anymore. Yeah. Um. And you know. Um. In some ways. Oh, whoa, baby. Hang on. In some ways they might have not. Oh, yeah. That one made three hundred million more. Yeah. I don't know what um, happened there. Yeah. Well, I remember that about this one is that it didn't really make a whole lot of money. Um. As much, and it was a commercial success. I mean, right. it, You know, and uh, and it was a cr- very critically acclaimed. Let's talk um, about that a little bit too but, here. The yeah. the reviews. The reviews I know you picked for us to read, um, I was actually fascinated by because I don't remember it being quite as negative. Yeah. And it should be said it was generally praised. I mean, so yeah. overall, yeah. more people liked it than didn't. Right. But I was actually kind of shocked by some of the negative, and actually agreed with many of the yeah. more negative reactions on the movie. Um, I think Brian Tallarico for uh, uh, RogerEbert.com mm-hmm. gave it three and a half stars. Yeah. He was very positive. Yeah. But um, uh, Cam Austin Collins, when he was writing for The Ringer, kind of gave a mixed to negative yeah. review. Um, what were your thoughts on kind of maybe well, how the movie was yeah. received back then and then versus how maybe as the years gone well, by, it's your interesting own interpretation and, of it? Well, first of all, let me say, I, I'll kind of yeah give my own opinion about the movie, I guess. I think it's interesting because when I saw it... Um, I loved it, and I thought, oh, this is the second best Planet of the Apes movie, you know. Um, the second to... To the original. Okay. To the original one. Yeah. Um, the 1968 movie, which we feel so far away from. I know, point. it's hard to believe. Um, <laughs> it's and, from a different era, a yeah, different time. It I mean, literally was, yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, the more I've thought about it, the less I like it in strange ways. Yeah. Um... Because I think that, and I think people locked, latched onto this. People, I'm th- I think thankfully that I didn't realize at the time, saw right through how kind of pretentious this movie actually really is. Um, and that it's like, no, we're really going to make 
a movie out of this. And it's like, I don't know. I, I mean, we said it, we just said it, we watched it again a minute ago about what, uh, Orson Welles? No, uh, no. Kenneth Lonergan said yeah. about Doctor Strange about like, I go to see stuff happen. It's like, yeah. it's not about like, and like, I get it. You know, these movies in general tried to do this about elevating it. And I understand that. And these were ultimately part of a post dark night wave of movies of trying to make movies, these franchise things more serious. And I get that. And I like that we have this version of that, but at the same time, this is where I think it starts to break down a little bit. Not completely. I still think it's a really, really good movie actually, uh, overall, but, um, it just kind of, it's a little too long and a little too serious, a little too self-serious. Um, and what I've realized over the course of watching these movies is that ultimately what's more worthwhile are those original five, even when they're not good, because they're making, they're taking chances while still being really goofy and really out there and like, okay, this is inherently kind of dumb in a way. Mm -hmm. Um, even though I take it very seriously they don't always take themselves seriously, the movies. Um, and these, I feel like, take themselves a little too seriously, which, you know, that's think, a that's an yeah. ult ultimately something that had to happen, and I'm thankful that it did. But at the same time, uh, I don't think that always makes for the most, um, I guess, just the best movies. I don't yeah, know, I think but. in comparison, when you look at the original five versus these, this trilogy of three, is that those original five were really playing by their own rules and beating to their own drum. And even when they didn't work, felt like they were off on a limb and doing their own thing. These movies feel like they are playing a little bit more to what the temperature of the time yeah. is, specifically that post-Nolan uh, Batman thing. Um, and especially just visually, the way they look. And other than that, I think the first one's easier to distinguish because... Not only its plot, but its visual style is kind of one very specific thing. But then two and three for me again run together, and I've and again one's got Gary Oldman and one's got Woody Harrelson, and that's kind of the ways I sometimes easily re distinguish them. Um, and so, and again, I can't help but say, and I've said this already, and I'll say it kind of one last time today, that the CGI apes, while I understand why they did that, does lose something for me. It loses a notch. Yeah. Weirdly, one of the things that I want to talk about that I seized on, or what these reviews seized on, I guess, the more positive reviews was basically like, oh, you will root for the apes over the humans in these movies. Yeah. As if that's something, A, to be proud of, and B, to be, you know, admired on these movies that you don't buy into yeah. humanity. And this goes back to what I said about the CGI-fication of these apes. Um is that to totally make them so other than human yeah. is to lose a little bit of the metaphor of what the movies were going for, I think. Right. Um, now, it doesn't mean that they still can't be about slightly other things and still do it well, but I do think it loses a human touch or a human element. Right. Um, and I'll be curious, too, when we get to the very end of this, if this is a, quote, happy ending, or is this, or are we still expectant of the... What happens when Taylor finally will arrive? Yeah, it's kind of like of it's kind of like the ending of Battle. Um, yeah, similar question yeah. we had at that is: like, is this changed or is it still going to be? And you know, yeah, that one we kind of fell on. It maybe did, it, it was, was changed. Yeah, I believe personally. I, we'll we'll maybe revisit that question yeah. for this. Yeah, but and there. it sounds like we're you know being real down on the movie. I still think it's really good, but I've actually been wrestling with it a little bit over the last few years and been really thinking, is this as good as I think it is? And I don't I don't know. I mean, because it is technically, yeah. of course. And I think even narratively, but I don't know. It does it it, it it feels long. I mean it's it's a it's a sit. Where it, where Dawn was not, I don't feel yeah. like. And, and then yeah. it's longer, but it never felt like it really had much that you would cut or yeah. get rid of. To that point, and I kind of had that question going into Dawn, but now I think it's actually more present for this. Is this movie just literally tracing in the lines a little bit too much, and is it different enough from Dawn to justify yeah. its existence? And once again, the justification is that like Caesar getting revenge and definitively giving up humanity, but at the, like. It's like, but is that worth a whole move this long of a movie? I don't know. Um, yeah. So, 
Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I didn't expect actually to go into this franchise at the beginning feeling this way at the end about this movie specifically. Um, it should be said but, uh, there are likely some of our frustrations while we do like these yeah. uh, three movies is probably a little bit of tired tiredness yeah. from watching all of these. Yeah. But also again, just the dynamism and the um in your faceness and the directness of those first movies. Yeah. Gets a little bit lost as we got into the Burton movie, and then as we got into these, they just yeah. don't quite are in conversation right. with the culture. You know why? Because those original ones were conceived at a time, and we're not in that time anymore. We're yeah. in a new time. You know what I mean? Right. And so, if you're not really working hard to figure out what does this mean today, as opposed to rinse and repeat, then you lose something. You know? Yeah. Uh, that's just natural. Um, another thing we want to talk about too, and we already mentioned Apocalypse Now is that this movie wears its influences on its sleeves. It got compared a lot in uh, the reviews to Westerns. Also, another thing we brought to mind is prison movies. Yeah. Um, what yeah. What do those hallmarks or references mean to you when, with this movie? Well, as far as prison movie goes, I've talked about this already. I don't like prison movies um, almost as much as I don't like courtroom movies. So, if we can, um, so your whole frustration with the criminal justice system yeah, in many well, ways. Well, it is hardly reflected. works anyway, so yeah. I mean, you know, uh, maybe that's part of it. I don't know, I just find it really boring. Um, I don't like watching people A, argue, or B, escape from things. Um, that's not something I have a whole lot of... So escape yeah. from the Planet of the Apes? Uh, uh, well, now that... Uh, <laughs> well, you know. But I mean, but what I will say about this one is it's not the whole movie. So yeah. that I can stomach. Right. Oh, as um, is with white heat, that's right, part of the movie. But, right, right, but even that, I sometimes am like, okay, good. Put the zoot get suit out on of that there. copper. Like Put it. that zoot suit <laughs> on that copper. Give him a little air, okay? <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, yeah, I just, I'm not all into that whole <sighs> sort of thing. I'm just thinking about, like, you imagine, like, older Cagney playing Zeus in the original oh my movie. God. Or him. What if they had made that movie in the Which 19- Mari Sevens is good uh, yeah. as well, what if they Zayas, what if but... they had made that movie kind of like in the 30s like Things to Come. Oh, right? well, yeah. In that era of Planet of the Apes. Like, and uh... you put James Cagney as the Tailor character and he's doing a lot of what? why you mugging uh, like, also like, like yeah. what? Why? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah, when he sees no, that's the ending is when he sees the Statue of Liberty he does what? <laughs> In here all alone, you know, and like, <laughs> and and like, then there's a moment where he's like, "Why you monk?" and like hits, you know, and like, and then you have Frank McHugh as an ape in there somewhere, kind of like bad ape in this. Yeah. He's like, oh, "Okay, pasa," you know, in yeah. his whole deal, you know, and then like, uh, and Sheridan yeah. plays an ape. Oh, or, sure, or somebody. Yeah, and like, then like, you know. uh, maybe you get Sydney Green Street as Zayas or something. Oh my god, you know, like. At, yeah, you're just like, now making me mad that yeah. this didn't happen. I mean, like, wow, that's the greatest not, movie that never happened. Yeah, was the th- 30s, I mean, it would have been too version. early. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, no, that's what that's what's interesting though. Is you think about that? I mean, that was the era of a lot of those. There were a lot of science fiction movies that were being made in the 30s and 40s randomly. A lot of people forget that, especially they all, you know, they certainly the didn't hold a place 20s, in the culture right, as they did before later, then, or later, before or after. Right, yeah, um, but that's true. Yeah. But but yeah, there were some. I mean, not as many, but. Um, you're just making well, I mean, movie now. serials were happening that. during that time, too. You know, you had all those, like... That's what it would have been more of. It would have been now, movie serials. Now, uh, just but. know that off mic, we're just going to be now creating and quoting yeah. what that movie like, would be. You monk. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> Two for one, monk. Yeah. yeah. Um. What? Uh. Yeah, but anyways, where were we at on all this? Talking about the, the prison movies, yes. I think. Yes, okay, so that's the thing, is that at the end, it's like, oh, he needs to escape, and all yeah. this stuff. And yeah, I find all that to be kind of a slog. Um, so that's part of why I'm not as into the movie as it goes on is because it's like, oh, it's just doing that stuff a little bit. and uh, Especially the way the movie opens, uh, which is really amazing. And then I think the whole final battle is pretty great. And uh, I mean, there's things I really, I mean, I really like the movie, but but over time I've kind of, I've kind of gotten a whiff of its of its BS a little bit, you know. It's it's a little bit too much of a Does movie. Does any of this impact at all your anticipation of the Batman for Matt Reeves? No, 
That doesn't for me either. Yeah. But I just, you know, um, always remember. It's interesting because, again, these movies are weirdly inspired a little bit, in, directly or indirectly, by the Nolan Batman movie. Yes. So it'd be interesting to see him actually yeah. do a Batman movie. I feel like that movie looks pretty different. No, it does. As far as I think it these does. newer stuff, this newer stuff. I mean, the Riddler definitely looks different. I'll say mm-hmm. that. That looks like that's totally. I wouldn't be surprised if he just said to Paul Dano, come up with whatever you want to do. And do it, and that Paul. Or there's like a vague idea or conception, and then he did his right. Or that they they probably, you know, what really happened is probably that they talked about together. That's probably what you know. There's a whole thing in movies called collaboration. Yeah, you know, sometimes people forget that. But I just know what a creative force that Paul Dano is, so I know that he had to have had something. I don't know. And then also the uh, Colin Farrell Penguin. I'm just continually like, what even is that? In a good way, like Mm -hmm. I don't even know what that is. So, um. But yeah, I think that ultimately, uh, the thing I'm expecting out of War for the Planet of the Apes, it's a beautiful, uh, pretty interesting, but kind of uh, tedious movie. Would you say way. that acts as its own metaphor for all three of these movies in a loose roundabout way? Probably. Even though we do find, we did find I, a I'm lot a of things of them, to like about yeah. the yes. first two, especially yeah. as we've done those already. I'd say so. Yeah. Well, we'll see. As we go through the movie. So, no, this is it. This is Are it. you ready? We're almost there. Yep. We're going to take a brief break. You're going to hear the trailer. Oh, one one other whoa, thing. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Real quick. I wanted to say before we moved on because I find this so interesting. The um, cinematographer for this movie was Michael Sar- Sarazen or Sarazen. I'm not sure how you say Sarazen, that. Sarazen, maybe. I think who so. randomly has done a lot of really random movies. He did a lot, he, he filmed a lot of movies for Alan Parker, uh, Bugsy Malone. Midnight Express, Fame, Shoot the Moon, Birdie, good. Angel Heart, and Come See the Paradise all in a row. A Angel Heart, that's that's a wacko. Movie. Um, and then he also randomly did Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Okay. Um, and that's the main stuff. And then he's he did that Mowgli Legend of the Jungle, that Andy Circus yep. movie. Um. And then Gunpowder Milkshake. That just recently came out on and Netflix. And then Hippie Hippie Shake, which is yet to come out. So yet. a lot of shakes in his yeah, uh, late, right. late period. Um, That's going to be about that. Oh, you remember that magazine Oz? Yeah. It's about that, I think. Okay. Yeah. About, the, I guess, the making of that or something. That's like, interesting. You know, in, uh, in Australia. But anyway, so I think it's interesting that, I just think it's interesting that's what came out of these. Um. But anyway, so is that that guy's like, oh, that's what I want to do, you know, right. with it. So, or that's who I want as far as Reeves. Sure. Anyway. He, and he did the the second one. No, he uh, just did this one. Or wait, did he? I did thought, he? I thought I'd saw. Okay, on his then list I had forgotten credits. that. I had forgotten I think that he did. But let's uh, let's see. Da, 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 yep. Okay. Sorry about yeah. that. Didn't remember. I don't know why we didn't yeah, talk about that. I saw on his credits. I don't know why we didn't talk about that already, but yep. Well, anyway. we mentioned him there anyway. Anyway, by the way. By the way. Right. So, we're going to take a brief break. You're going to hear the trailer for War for the Planet of the Apes. Then we're going to dive right into the movie. He's a smart one, isn't he? What are you going to name him? Do they look like just apes to you? They're animals! He saved our lives. He was remarkable. Apes! Apes! Together! Strong! Strong! You're him. You're Caesar. We've been searching for you for so long. I do not start this war. I fight only to protect apes. Human gets sick, ape gets smart, then human kill ape, but not me, I run. There are times when it is necessary to abandon our humanity, to save humanity. you say eventually you'd replace us that's the law of nature so what would you have done 
What did the humans promise you? No matter what you do, you'll never be one of them. You are a We are the beginning! Apes together! Strong! We are the beginning! Apes together! Strong! Have you come to save your apes? I came for you. And we're back on the ride. I'm sorry, no, yeah. I did that. Big fans of 957 yeah. here. Classic rock station. On the ride. Uh, we just recently, in between kind of yes, to be stopping serious, yeah. this and uh, watching the trailer, that uh, Ed Asner actually just passed away. Mm-hmm. Um, I know he was on the older side. Um, he was 91, actually. Mm, okay. um, I know he was most iconically known for the Mary Tyler Moore show. Okay. Um, he was actually one of the very first characters, uh, actors, I should say, who was awarded Emmys, I think, in the best comedy and drama category for the same character. Really? Later into the show, yeah. Um, okay. And so I actually haven't watched a whole lot of Mary no, Tyler Moore's show, but I, I've only ever heard good things about yeah. it. I know that's what most people remember him from. Right. As. I can't help but myself think of Carl from Up. He did yeah. the voice for that. Um, and you know what I'm going to think of. Yeah, yeah. you're it's thinking a, of JFK. JFK, yeah. I mean... I always like my file. You've been the only one here today. What do you mean you're going to write a book? <laughs> I mean, you know. Uh, and I say all this in extreme uh, love for Ed Asner. I mean, he's... Uh, also, voice really... of Granny Goodness. That's in a true. Superman that's that something series. that I'm always shocked to remember. Uh, but then you hear the voice, and you're like, oh, that's clearly Ed right. Asner. <laughs> yeah, but um, love Ed Asner. Uh, sorry to see him go. But he lived a full life yeah, and uh, had a lot of great performances and... Uh, so, yeah, we just wanted to dedicate this podcast to him. Yeah, so may he, re- so may he rest in peace. So, we are watching this yet again off the standard issue Blu-ray. Oh, yeah, I need to remember. Yeah, Ooh. why was this rated Let me just PG-13? Da, 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 da. Probably eight, kill eight, man, violence, language. Um, All the usual stuff. Sequences of sci-fi violence and action, thematic elements, and some disturbing images. Thematic elements. Yeah. How vague that is. Uh, what did you think of the trailer? It was all right. No, it was a trailer. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> that's our deep, <laughs> that's our our deep last, and considered that's thoughts. Last, uh, tr- Ape trailer. Ape trailer opinion. Yeah. Phenol, as uh, Bane once said. We've said, um, just to give you a little bit of a preview of what the future of the ape the ape cast may yeah. hold, mm. that undoubtedly there will be more of these movies made. Yeah, and we're going to so talk about that at the end. We, yeah, so. so we'll talk about that later. Yeah, but that we'll do, basically what you were going to say is we're going to do those whenever yeah. they happen. Whenever they yeah. happen, presumably but, years from now. Yeah. Uh, I know I, for one, I know I can speak for you too. Ready to take a break from the yeah. apes. Nothing against them. Uh, we had fun with them, but ready to move on. But we got to get through this last one first. So, again, we're watching the Blu-ray, and we're going to hit play in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. On the ride. On the ride. <laughs> Getting the uh, 20th yeah. Century Fox fanfare <laughs> yeah, with some uh, drums. With some stank on it. Mm-hmm. They, you think they should have tried to stylize the logo at all? No. Like make it ape or jungle nope. lock? Nope. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> you, you generally don't like no, that? I, and, no, I just don't care either yeah. way. But, uh, but uh, I, yeah, I don't really normally like that type of thing, but that's just me. I'm neutral on it sometimes. It's I mean, I could though. care less if they did it. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have like gotten up and walked we, out um, or something. Notice the new um, Warner Brothers logo that we saw before. Um, yeah, I don't like it. I mean, no, I know it? nobody it does, saw? but at the same time, um, it was reminiscent. Yeah. But at the same time, guess what? It's just a corporate logo. Yeah. It means nothing, yeah. literally. So who cares? Yeah, it's true. I remember back when it had, that had came out some weeks or months ago, and people yeah. would complain about it. And as you said, yeah. 
15 years ago, a scientific experiment gone awry gave rise to a species of intelligent apes and destroyed most of humanity with a virus that became known as the simian flu. In case you didn't see rise. With the dawn of a new ape civilization led by Caesar, the surviving humans struggled to coexist. But fighting finally broke out when a rebel ape, Koba, led a vengeful attack against the humans. Dawn. The humans sent a distress call to a military base in the north where all that remained of the U.S. Army was gathered. Ruthless Special Forces Colonel and his hardened battalion were dispatched to exterminate the apes. Evading capture for the last two years, Caesar is now rumored to be marshalling the fight from a hidden command base in the woods as the war rages on. You know, it's interesting I talked about the whole War. Uh, night, dawn, day yeah. of the dead, that it kind of is doing like what the Day of the Dead poster looks like, where it's like, we had night, we had dawn, now day. Like, you know, yeah. but anyway, I'd forgotten that. Good time for Bonzo. <laughs> And this is basically the last of uh, vigilant humanity. As Huey Lewis would say, If this is it, mm, what, <laughs> please let me know. <laughs> this, this, we could use a little bit of yeah. Huey Lewis. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> I loved, you know, what a, re, what a like, welcome presence. Um, obviously, you know, that music was, what was it, the band uh, in the last movie? Yeah. And, Oh, nice little respite in this one. It's like nothing will like you. Yeah. You know nothing of hell. Basically, yeah. like nothing's going to save you now. In the vein of that one orc in uh, <laughs> two towers, yeah. nothing's going to save, save you. Now it's like Michael Bolton or yeah. something. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, wait a minute. So see, it was where we have those uh, basically the donkeys, prisoner of war. Yeah. Apes, yeah. Donkey. Donkey! That's all we're going to talk about that movie. No. We'll never do those movies on here. I promise you that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> what, more apes? Are you kidding me? Or is there a planet of these things out there? Muffled response. I noticed uh, one of the reviews pointed this out that they refer to him as Kong. Yep. As in, like, you know, vaguely yeah. reminiscent of the Viet Kong, like. Uh, but K O N G. And, like, Monkey Kong. Yeah. A proverbial monkey man. He's going to give a sermon. Yeah. <laughs> Fire and brimstone it's a, variety. It's a daggum <laughs> Call of Duty game or something. Like. Yeah, yeah. There's probably a lot of who knows. Maybe us. I don't remember. We would have saw this back in the day. Be like, oh yeah, explosive tip. Yeah. Like, and then that first Black Ops explosive tip crossbow. It's not gonna work. Yeah. You know, it's interesting just if you think about the color palettes and the locations of these movies in comparison to the originals and yeah. or the Tim Burton movies that, you know, those had sometimes memorably desert landscapes at some times and these movies don't really play in that. I like that uh, these are much, much more lush yeah. looking, yeah. I mean, it, it, it just is a variety. It's something different, you know. Because what I think is interesting about that is it's essentially kind of saying that in a way implicitly that nature is taking back over the earth right. and yeah. that you know as opposed to the aesthetic of the originals is like destroyed, destroyed nature all, bombed yeah. out right. and so that yeah it's different but I would honestly like for future movies to see like a Hawaiian tiki location you know yep. South Pacific apes like yep. just chilling and vibing on moment, the, by the water like oh yeah we are a yeah. we are venom <laughs> like we are Carnage, or here comes what? Here comes Carnage. What's this new Venom it movie looks called? Stupid. What are Harrelson's yeah, in? Whatever. Rage Against the Machine. Carnage Rage Against something. Carnage or something. Yeah. 
monks with just, guns. Yeah. They finally figured out how to use them, I guess. Which they did a little bit, in the, obviously, in the last movie. But. Well, I'm an A-Kong 47. This is one of the more interesting, memorable things to me of the movies is the, the these donkey apes. Yeah. Or these prisoner of war apes, kind of the the guilt or the complicitness they feel being on the other side right. and being forced to watch the death of their brethren, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Wake up, because it's time to die. I mean, <laughs> you know. Gassy discharge. gas that was just like was it garden variety like smoke grenades yeah, or like okay more or less. Yeah. if it was more than that You specifically. I don't yeah. even know who you are, but Well, if you can't make it, just you know, get some. Get one here or there. Oops. Trying to be a Paz of Glory moment here. Mm-hmm. Also, it's like first person. You know. Yeah. And so here's Caesar back again. Last time. Mm-hmm. Until the next time. I will say this Caesar, I see a little bit more, I think, of Circus's face yeah. uh, than I even noticed in the last one. Mm hmm. No one thing about this movie too is there's less a little less dialogue overall. Yeah, that's something that some of the reviews remarked yeah. upon, yeah. Who the heck else would he be? Yeah. You know? Idiot. Maybe Nero or Yeah. Otho. Yeah. Long live the ape. You do in this movie a little bit more than the past ones, I guess, get this little bit of division of disagreement yeah. ideologically amongst the apes, mm -hmm. which would perhaps lead us to believe that the future of 
what we see in the original movie, two movies will come to pass in terms yeah. of the apes themselves fracturing in the long run. That literally looks like a gorilla. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. Like, I mean, yeah. That gorilla and how to talk, yeah. 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 <laughs> that winner, I, I think they call him yeah. Ape, the albino looking looks like somebody we know. I won't say who it is, but kind of. Again, if you have any interest in knowing yeah. of these secret <laughs> references, who, who I, know, I, I like this person, so it isn't. An, feel know, free to email but. us. This reminds me, actually, uh, I'll find a little lull at some point here. Read the first email we have yet to receive. Oh, yeah, we need to talk about that. Um, for this we'll talk podcast. About that here in a little bit, yeah. about this but it can also be said our last two YouTube videos have not been flagged yeah make it make sense Does Maurice talk much? I don't really remember. Uh, no, Mostly I don't just sign. think so. Yeah. Got the way. <laughs> What's interesting to think about is that, you know, for all these apes, um, where they're at, which is, a, you know, was st we're still in California, yeah. I'm guessing, Northern California. Yeah. Um, it's like, oh, the quote, back to nature, but this is not their own natural habitat, I would presume, you know, any right. apes really in uh, that part of North America, I don't think yeah. really, by that point, native there, but... But they're doing what they can because they can't go anywhere else, I guess. Or would really want to. Horses. I think not having um, Caesar's son being more of, uh, even more of a character than he was in the second movie actually kind of hurts in his in this movie his death it means a little less because i think yeah. i think it paid lip service to him being a little bit more of a character yeah but it's like more to drive a wedge between caesar and coba not on his own terms and right. so when he passes away in this it's kind of like oh yeah i kind of know who that is and, right but it feel doesn't feel as yeah resonant as it maybe could Well, these are kind of parts of a piece anyway, these two movies, where it honestly feels like it could have all been one really big, long movie, and you cut sections out of it, you know, yeah. out of this one mainly, but. And here's Judy Greer yet again to stand around and monkey around, like. give birth to more children, and yeah. you know. Cornelius. Uh, Cornelius now. Cute little monks. Little monk titties. <laughs> Still got that scar from the last movie though. Yeah.
kind of fun. I guess I'm guessing it's like a female ape. Yeah. It, it, it's just kind of funny that it's like, oh, this whole thing between them, and it's like, oh, whatever, we're, that's not going to be a thing here in a minute. So. Something to bring up now. Was there many like tie-in novels or comics or anything with really these, associated with these movies? Uh, I think there were some. Yeah. Yeah. Have you read any no. of that? No. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was actually that's what I was kind of looking for yesterday at Barnes and Noble. I didn't find it. So, oh, well. Instead, though, uh, you among some other books and some things you bought, we bought you bought this. Uh, I would say new, but it's actually an older version of Clue. Yeah. From the eighties, I believe. That yep. we played and we uh, last night with our mother and uh-huh. had a lot of fun with that actually because yeah. uh, had some new people and rooms and weapons that we hadn't seen before so right. there's like kind of more to it. But. <laughs> Shut your out. <laughs> Are figuring out what we're going to do. I guess yeah, they're sort of trap where they're at because yeah, the people go boom boom. It's a very evocative location here under like mm-hmm. a waterfall. It looks cool. Because it reminds me sort of those sections in Last of the Mohicans. Of, uh, yeah, waterfalls. it does look like that. Whoops. Two men come in. No, Michael Chikino, I believe, did the score. Mm-hmm. The SD does a lot of Reeves and Abrams kind of movies. Well, some he did the last one too, didn't he? Uh, he probably did. I can't quite remember. Let me. Look. We kind of talked it about it, but just look today's feature article on Wikipedia is Raiders of the Lost Ark. Okay. No, today's this week's or not this week, but this year's obviously the. Uh, 40th anniversary of mm-hmm. that. Yeah, but he, I just think like, Jaquino did do the Dawn. Yeah. Like I said, he does most every Reeves slash Abrams thing. So. Brad Bird, too. Speaking of Brad Bird, and this is something I was going to ask you about this. What do you think a uh, live, or not live, but an animated feature length Planet of the Apes movie would work or could be interesting? Yeah, I mean, you could do that. Be something different in the franchise. Mm-hmm. Well, they had the animated show. Right. Yeah, I mean, if that's what it takes to make a good story out of it. Right, I mean, if the story. It matches with that, you know. Not, yeah. Don't do that just for the sake of doing right. it. But. I can't 
can't even imagine how hard it'd be to animate those shots where those. Yeah. Got to do all the effects and that light in there. Yeah. Literally sounds like a Call of Duty villain. Right? Yeah. The way he talks. Uh. The way he looks back here. Yeah. <laughs> Looking like Willard in Apocalypse Now. Yeah. This jump <laughs> is a real like. My last, my last card to play. Yeah. Like, Mola. Very brutal and mm -hmm. very upsetting, frankly. To, to be one thing, just to he, his. Uh, by the way, not yeah. to take away from that, his face there looked like the. Gollum. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. That moment. Yeah. It's like, what? And part of me gets the impulse to make Harrelson's villain in this a little more arch and a little more exaggerated and a little less likable. Yeah. Because I feel like in some ways that's what humanity would be pushed towards yeah. by this point. But it does add a little bit of a not quite relatability the yeah. Oldman had maybe in the last one or certainly Jason Clark Jason Clark was even obviously yeah. more of a heroic figure than Oldman was but you gotta wonder what happened to those characters I know the movie doesn't really care about them yeah. but uh, between these maybe they went and lived in a you know overgrown Burger King somewhere I don't know and what is kind of funny about that choice of facial expression at that moment yeah. was that he's literally thinking, Murderer. Yeah, like, <laughs> I mean, it all know. fits. You yeah, know? so. Jan so Winter? He was, he was the betrayer, huh? He was the rat. We should have known, like. I can't remember. I think it turns out he wasn't, maybe, or he was. I don't. Or, or he was. Either but, it was or he wasn't. Yeah. You know, it's hard to know. I'm just be thinking about that the rest of the time now. <laughs> so you got to imagine. You know, this is a tough moment for Caesar because, for the most part, he's even despite everything. If not defended humanity, at least pulled a punch for humanity. Yeah. And now it's like, well, look what that's destroyed his family, you know, now. That right. Tenuous faith he's had. I had forgotten that the... Uh... The mom had died, or the wife had yeah. died too. So, and part of me cynically can't help but look at that and go, "Well, you never really cared about her, anyways, and then you're going to use her as an emotional yeah. punchline, you know?" Like, yeah. Again, this isn't the only movie to do that, but still. Neighbors getting his motorcycle out. You know. Going for a little Sunday drive, you know, Sunday ride. Poor Monty. Maurice on a horse, though, you know? Yeah.
Was Caesar wanting to go it alone? Where's he going? Would you not listen? You can't read the script. It's like Harry Potter and almost any Harry Potter short. No, I gotta do this alone. Yeah. No help whatsoever. And then Ron Hermione like, no, we were coming too. And, and then, then like, they yeah. always save him. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it would be good if you just realized, yeah, why don't you come along? Oh, for a second you saw that cute little uh, baby orangutan. but uh, Oh, well. He's going by. These horses, by the way, I need a horse check. You know, they're just still like, well, these are things are riding us now instead of those other things. Yeah. Mm. Or think half the time these thing these things weigh more. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, most of them would a daggum gorilla right Look there. Look at it. How it's gorilla's got to weigh at least six hundred pounds. I mean. Yeah. At least. Yeah, more than that, probably. Average gorilla weight. Yeah, that's what I'm going to Google here. So, Western Gorilla, 350. Eastern, 310 to 350. Or 450. Oh, okay. So, not as much. Okay, yeah, I expect to be a little more. I guess they're so, their body mass is so big. And I kind of expected uh, yeah, to be a little bigger. But. 350 or one Winfield Scott, you know, like. <laughs> we just started watching the uh, Ken Burns Civil War yeah. series and we got through the first episode. We'll give you an update on that when uh, we're all done. Uh, Look, Coca-Cola. It's great. In the background. There's also Coke Santa too. Yeah, mm -hmm. but yeah, Civil War is great. So, you know, well, not the real thing. No, no I mean it, it ended in a just cause one, but yeah, it was necessary in a sad way. But yeah, we're talking about Kim Burns Civil War. The Squad. Nova's coming here in just a second, right? Or uh, are there some other humans? In, uh, pop I can't up remember if it's in this part or some, they, find, they pick up somebody, don't they? Bad ape or something. That's nah, later. Oh, wait. this guy. They clearly had weapons. Yeah. Like, you really think that well, was... he was over there, there so... Is this scene in particular, a scene like this, that kind of draws up some Western archetypal yeah. uh, imagery? I'm feeling. So he's part of that other group. Mm-hmm. Well, the, you, you know. Mm hmm mm. You love it. Tasty. Somebody just kind of stumbled into the theater at this point. It was like this very intense looking shot over yeah. the shoulder of an ape. Then the cuts yeah. here, they got guns. It's yeah. like, what? <laughs> that gun monkey got a gun, you know. <laughs> yeah, dad <Dag> gun. <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't get a translation on what that. <laughs> <is>. <laughs> It's gonna be one of our last episodes yeah. to get out some of our monkey sounds. Yeah. You know? <laughs> we haven't done it nearly as much on this podcast as yeah. we do in real life sometimes. So yeah. just be aware of that. And we just do it without having to think about playing yeah. apes. So. Well, 
know, sorry if we killed your dad, but, you know. We got you, wife. <laughs> we got you, child. <laughs> oh, that's right. You're dead when you are talking to your corpse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you expect? You're dead, you know? Yeah. And it's like the saddest looking thing ever. Yeah. Do you remember that moment towards the end of Psycho where they walk up into Norman Bates' bedroom and it's like his, like he still sleeps in there because he's like a child, you know? Yeah. And in the corner, there's that like stuffed animal and that's literally the saddest looking thing I've ever seen mm-hmm. like it's like like wow like yeah. it's just very effective like Yeah, she can't talk because of the whatever, what have you, Mm -hmm. the disease. So again, it's like the we're seeing the reality of the humans becoming more inarticulate, or they're becoming more articulate. Maurice with the heart of Harry Gold, you know. Always ends up back on the beach with these apes, mm-hmm. you know. Apes on the beach, I mean. <laughs> Should be the spin off, you know. <laughs> yeah. Beach of the apes. Like, you know, and like. They just take over one beach. Like, yeah, while they're playing drunk on a plane, you know, yeah. just hanging out. Like, <laughs> and yank on my chain. Toes in the water. Yeah. Ape in the sand. And red, redneck yacht club. <laughs> <laughs> All the awful, like, country music that's just about, like, beaches and And or water. waterfront. Yeah. And way down under in the Chattahoochee, you know, like. <laughs> or it gets hotter than a hoochie coochie. I guess. I don't know. And a little bit of that chew to back, chew to back, chew to back speed. <laughs> Breathing heavily. Is it Tony Soprano Brandon. now? <laughs> like you're gonna die now like you know He wanting to build a wall or something. Mm. Yep. To like get away from the other humans that they're fighting with.
oh, oh, oh. Whimpering. I hate when those indistinct conversations come up. Go to sleep, you little baby. Yeah. You know. <laughs> We might have mentioned that whole scene earlier when we were talking about circus and yeah. maybe rise, but that is really one, a tour de force scene. Yeah, but I don't think we did. I don't and, know if we did talk about that. Yeah, that maybe. whole back that but, shot reverse shot, yeah. basically of him and two towers. Was uh, did he play a, have a role in Ten Ten? Yeah. Was he that captain guy? Yeah. Meanwhile. I think I'd kind of forgotten Koba pops up in any capacity in this. Riding horses. Mm hmm. Beautiful scenery yep. here. There's some apes in the snow action. I want some more of that. And it's something we haven't really seen much of at all. Yeah, because I'm not all that crazy, really, honestly, about the way, that I'll be honest, about the original movies, the, like desert look of those and I don't really like the way that looks compared to this but I, I like it for that but yeah I do like that these are trying yeah, I mean, those other are, places you yeah. know those are really good but it's just like yeah I don't really like the way that looks so it's like California like yeah you know this is in California too but you know but it is more Northern California. Mm -hmm. Which is different. Find some corpses here. Yeah, these are the, uh, I think some of the humans that have the, the, uh, disease. Mm-hmm. They put out here basically because there's, yeah, they just left them, them off. They they're... just left them behind and killed them, yeah. Yeah. So, how are you to blame for this? She trusts her. 
you know. Mm-hmm. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Brasi. Luca. Luca Brasi. Rocco. You know what I like about that? It didn't do the stupid old gunshot from far away. It just like moved on. Yeah. It was just like, yeah, he killed him. Yeah, like, yeah. Most of the other movie would have had that. Yeah. Meanwhile, yeah. Like that Not an articulate like human inside, like just person. vibing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's a tricksy one, you know. He's just all about the life. Vibing to his vibes and content. Oh my god! Yeah. As Arnold once said, two apes on a horse. They're like, all right, I can't deal with yeah. this. I can't deal. This whole part's kind of stupid. <laughs> Just like, what is going on? Like, you gotta have a set piece. Was the Overlook Hotel? Great interior. Mm -hmm. Good parking. from some big old juice there. Thing they pointed out, like, mm -hmm. does that just like an atom bomb? Like, yeah, <laughs> I took this too. Binoculars. <laughs> I mean, the same summer. Yeah. Seven. 
Now he wore human clothes. He weirdo. Which we'll find out is probably true, but him being weirdo. Little monkey. Yeah. I can see it, especially with the hair now of uh, yeah. again our Uncle Arnold. I don't know how old he's supposed to be as an ape, but yeah. Kind of balding. <laughs> oh. That pause is what made him funny. This gives you a little bit of uh, us a little bit of a window into the apes who weren't directly kind of a part of his right. thing from the beginning that were elsewhere in the world and kind of were lived these lives as yeah. ape animals or what have you. So yeah, that there are other places where the disease spread that yeah. where uh, apes were. And he's and Bad Ape seems frankly more interested in talking and more articulate than the grand majority of these other apes that have been kind of at Caesar's yeah. hand for some time. Yeah, that, that yeah, that's what I was gonna say is that this answer is more of like yeah, there are other apes, other places where that's, you know, yeah, more like that. Yeah, I gotta wonder how they'd uh, animate them eating yeah. with the uh, talking, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I never thought about the similarities between him and Hopper's character in Apocalypse Now, yeah. but it's true. In terms of he's kind of this frazzled, grizzled veteran of seen some really bad it's stuff. He's smart, yeah. but like, it's crazy. He's lost yeah. it a little bit. Yeah. Lost in the sauce. No. Oh, my God. No. My Reprisal. God. You know. Remember way back the Nova days, remember? Barely. But yeah. There's another female character who didn't talk at all, remember? Yeah. <laughs>
Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm trying to look at something. Sorry, I'm not always paying 100% attention yeah. to the podcast, but you know, I am most of the time, but pretty much all the time. Pretty much. Listen, I barely go on my phone so ever, yeah. so give me a give me a break. <laughs> my God. Break me off a piece of that. Kit Kat bar. Cobra bar. Uh, yeah. Like Caesar, how annoyed, honey, honestly. Yeah, like, so I don't even care. Can I hear your sob story now? Oh. Oh. Oh, 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 who killed? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Like, you know. This grill got a name. I don't even know if it's just... Uh, Luca. Luca, that's right. Got a name, yeah. <laughs> Luca Guadagnino's playing the apes. Interesting. Who's that one new movie he just produced that went on Netflix? Uh, were you aware of that? No, I don't think so. Who was in that? Let's see. I don't even know officially what Guadagnino's next movie is supposed to be because it seems as though he's got a lot of stuff I've heard announced, you know, but... Yeah. Because I haven't heard any more on Blood on the Tracks and movie you're supposed to make of the uh, pseudo adaption of the Bob Dylan album that's yeah. not currently on his upcoming projects on IMDB but yeah this movie Beckett directed by Ferdinand, Ferdinando Cito Filamarino mm -hmm. has John David Washington Boyd Holbrook Vicky Cripps Alicia Vikander but yeah, it's yeah. a Netflix. It went on Netflix. Okay. Probably planning some nefarious ass. Yeah, um, so probably like, oh, let's go kill a monkey somewhere. He took one. At least this time I was able to protect you.
And the girl feels sad by this, and you can tell the even Caesar feels touched. I guess that there is still something about yeah. humanity that's not totally yeah. irredeemable. But that human beings are perhaps better off if they don't talk. And you know what? Yeah. <laughs> more and more, that might be the tr- the case. The truth. Just shut up a little bit. You know. Again, Maurice is proud of his little Nova. Yeah. So now they're down an ape. Mm-hmm. It's all going bad. They must pay. that's another aspect of sometimes the moral relativism of these movies is that he's still not totally turned off against all of humanity. It's more of this specific revenge thing, even though that, you know, it's still what left of humanity is mostly bad. Yeah. But I sometimes question the rationality of him still clinging or hanging on to something though he was raised by humans so he yeah would have a sentimental attachment but right. there are times where I just wonder if it's just they're really questioning whether or not an audience would find it in themselves to root for them yeah if it turned and yeah. obviously here's the echoing of the original movies those kind right. of scarecrow yeah contraptions there the apes instead of humans kind of a reversal I guess that's the big prison Mm -hmm. ape jail it just has a sign that says that very starkly They're being, yeah, as kind of being expressed here, they're being used as slave labor. Yeah. These captured on all the So they can build that wall, apes, yeah. yeah. Grant and Lee, going back to that whole thing. Really? Surprised he's reading. Yeah, really. Heard. Heard what? (laughs) 
it was like right there at his head so yeah. i mean it ain't gonna be gonna be that great gonna of be a shot missing much yeah <laughs> Yeah, give you a little present. No, you didn't even really care, I guess. Yeah. Oh, well. well whatever. funny is Harrelson's character doesn't seem all that phased at all by the fact that uh, his ape's talking to him. Yeah. He's, just like, well, he's probably that's, so far gone what crazy is, at his I mean, yeah. point, you know. He's anyway. just like, well, this is the reality, so. Yeah. I don't know if you really said it earlier, maybe you did, I couldn't remember what you said, but do you have a favorite Woody Harrelson performance or uh, I don't in. know. I'm gonna have to think about that. I mean, his line reading of "He's a psychopathic killer," but so what? No, playing him around in no I'm country is too good. Now you see me. Have you seen the "Now You See Me" no, movies at all? No, I've seen the first you, one. It was you have, garbage. Yeah. Also, he was uh, probably most memorably in Zombie Land for a lot of people. Yeah. Time to nut up or shut up. Like, <laughs> why not just shut up, please? Die. Probably his performance in The Country for Old Men would probably be my favorite, but. And uh, Thin Red Line. Oh, yeah. I forgot about him in that. He's one of the cast of thousands in that. Yeah. I mean, you want to talk about, about a character that nuts up who shuts me. up? The spy who shagged me. <laughs> As himself. Yeah, no, but that. yeah, he does indeed <laughs> nut up. I mean, his nuts are up. We know that. <laughs> and he does shut yeah. up. I forgot about the spy who shagged me. So random of all the actors. Yeah. You ever seen that movie, uh, Ed TV, him and no. uh, McConaughey were in? Mm -mm. I remember seeing some of that on TV years ago. Is it like a comedy? Yeah, it's like kind of a comedy satire thing of, it's like, uh, I can't remember who it is, if it's McConaughey or him, but and the, one of them's the best friend of the other, you know, of one of them, their life becomes a reality show. Oh, okay. And they kind of, it's like a kind of a comedy satire. Kind of like Truman Show, but like way less talked about and mm -hmm. in some ways not nearly as uh, interesting in other ways yeah. either as far as what it's saying but it is a, it's a I kind of remember some of it so I guess the whole tribe or the herd got the whole D hive the whole daggum hive and uh hopefully fingers crossed by the next episode or next episode after that We'll have an update on how Coleman Domingo's character in yeah. the Candyman movie how he becomes villain. a villain. Yeah. Another one of my predictions. Again, last week we covered your reminiscence prediction. Didn't quite pan out, but you yeah. know. I respected the form nonetheless. And could could and could foresee have foreseen an alternate movie where that was yeah. uh, true. What's funny is we got about more or less an hour left, mm -hmm. and it's funny. This is like the last major location of the movie, so it's just like yeah. okay, like. So 
so running time wise is this right on par with the last one no the what? last one was like an hour or two hours and ten was so like this 10 is 10 minutes little, this longer. Is longer okay yeah and i wonder what the shortest movie would be would it be Probably, one of the originals uh, like four, three four or five battle i think okay. maybe Still playing the national anthem. No, actually, the shortest is uh, Conquest. Okay. At 88 minutes. He got he got a little cross on him, you know. So, you know, he's a believer, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wonder what the state of religion is amongst the uh, humans by this point. Yeah. Like, like probably uh, not what it should be. These movies never really touched um, ape religion at all, which obviously becomes a was a major yeah. aspect of the original films. But it's probably because they recognize that there is no such thing so far. Yeah, and it all got created out of this. Right. Yeah, and it's kind of the years that followed. Caesar himself would become like obviously like a Christ-like figure, maybe. Yeah. But. So in some ways, instead of Moses, or instead of Christ, he's more like a Moses type figure. I was thinking mm -hmm. in this movie, lead, leading his people out to the right. promised land, so to speak. Doing more Old Testament, yeah. I think. Strike begins. It begins. Monk begins, you know. Monk rebellion. Well, it's been a little bit into it by this point, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Well, you know. I'll get you. <laughs> Whatever.
chitter and stop, but it turned out. Oh, Cam Austin Collins had mentioned uh, how reminiscent this scene is of a uh, famous scene in Glory where yeah. Denzel Washington's character is flogged, essentially, mm -hmm. uh, for being insubordinate or disobedient. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to pull up what he said because it was interesting. So they end up resuming their work, but this was something uh, Collins singled singled out in kind of that moment. Mm -hmm. So in an audacious move, Reason Company reenact a scene from the from an actual slavery movie, Denzel Washington's Oscar-winning Whipping in Glory. Maybe you remember it: a stony Denzel, his face towards the camera, wincing with each strong whip, but memorably trying to avoid showing his pain. In the scene of quiet rebellion, that's the takeaway in War Two, as we watch Caesar get whipped. In much the same way, the camera closing in on what that prideful, implacable face. Someday, I'm sure I'll be in the mood to tease out just what's so pathetic about a rebellious black former slave getting reimagined as a humanoid, humanoid ape in a blockbuster. But why go there? I'm not offended. I'm bore, bored. War for the Planet of the Apes is being hailed as the best franchise film in recent memory, which is in large part, I reckon, because it tries so hard to seem more thoughtful and relevant than other franchise movies. The movie is bait for those of us who want to feel like our time spent with blockbusters should be somewhat enriching, somehow enriching, and not merely entertaining. That's a nice idea, I guess. There's no rule that says a genre movie can't aspire to moral seriousness, but blockbusters and all other movies should resist conflating moral seriousness with taking themselves too seriously. Which I think is a very mm -hmm. valid criticism, and something especially that I... Um, holding high regard as as he is a black critic, kind of singling yeah. that out as something yeah. he found a bit disingenuous, and kind of a quoting from another movie that kind of lacks the uh, political or historical import that that glory had yeah. as a movie. You know, Cam Austin Collins now writes for uh, Vanity Fair. Meanwhile, well, won't see you, see me. <laughs> I forgot any of the Hendrix yeah. in this. It's just like, why is that being played? Yeah. Like, uh,
I wonder why. Um, yeah. <laughs> in the words of uh, Mike Myers as the cat in the hat, mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that, come on now. Mike Myers is a human villain in these movies. Oh, my like, God. What that would be. Or Woody Harrelson ass cat in the hat. <laughs> Smoking a doobie <laughs> half the time, you know. Like, I mean, it should be like a trade. Yeah, like, yeah, right. The, he gets that, and then right. he gets that, you know. When he sees like an ape talking, well, surprise, surprise. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Look at me. I'm dead sexy. Look at my sexy body. <laughs> Donkey. I mean, yeah. I know it was on, um, relatively recently, I uh, I think I'd heard this and forgotten it, that um, originally um, Chris Farley was supposed to play Shrek. Uh, yeah, and his body type yeah. was even kind of based on Chris Farley, but that uh, mm -hmm. he died, and so Mike Myers played it. But how history would have been so so different, you know? Mm -hmm. Wonder where they'll make a new Shrek movie. You know that'll happen someday, right? Yeah. I'm kind of sort of surprised Shrek never became like a TV show for kids, you know? That would have been... Yeah. Like a, you know, I would think that would be a... would have been a merchandising bonanza, but... Yeah, so basically I was saying it's like that no matter what happens, the human virus is gonna kill everybody or or yeah. buy, or make everybody be primitive humans right. basically that even though they live that that's what's gonna happen so <laughs> <laughs> like you need to stop doing that sir sir <laughs> Like, sir, this is a military prison. Like, see, this is a window. This is an eight prison. <laughs> Black Gate Prison, like, as they would say. Black Gate Prison. Now I'm feeling like, you know, uh, should be said, you know, Woody Harrelson's uh, Venom Let There Be Carnage co star, yeah. uh, Tom Hardy. Like, and then if they do more of these movies somehow, he's like some sort of a ape human hybrid somehow yeah he's like half ape half human like what that would be eddie eddie for the record we have not seen venom but we watched the trailers yeah. here and there you know but and that we are carnage trailer it's like he literally looked like he was like tommy lee jones's two-faced the way he was dressed up like yeah so he killed his own son just because he was becoming that so he's insane. <laughs> well, he's going to be that later. So, I mean, he's running this funny farm now, Frankenstein. Yeah. Lost in the soul. Turn your back on family. What's that book you got there? Okay. Well, the Bible is one of them. But... I don't know. I need to crack that one back open again and do a little bit of review, you know? Yeah. <laughs> a little bit of Bible drilling, you know? Like... <laughs> Medically. Also, he's like an anti-vaxxer, I guess. Yeah. Like... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
you severed their heads like so did you kill them like So this could be a triple threat ladder match if we ain't careful, you know. <laughs> what? That's true about like anything though, don't you think? Yeah. All of human history has led to this moment. Like this moment where like we're when you get disappointed here. in the McDonald's drive through, you know? It will be a planet of apes. Yeah. I mean <laughs> Yeah, we went to the McDonald's today and it was a it was a S show. Well, like, we want to no reveal other. the location or uh no, just because I don't I don't know I don't. It's in the uh, eight two eight Caldwell County it's area. All, it's got at least among us, our family, our family, which we won't turn our back yeah. on, as we know. <laughs> um, it's got a really bad reputation that yeah. particular one, and again, kept, well, again, I've said it yeah. again and again. We need to stop going there. Stop giving it a chance. Today's the last straw for me. Yeah. So. Again, and we know we're talking about McDonald's. We're not talking about the finest culinary, you know, yeah, stuff. But come on, though, you know. <laughs> like when you complain to them about they getting the order yeah. wrong. <laughs> <laughs> this is everything they say. <laughs> But your order was an act of war. <laughs> Sorry if we blew your ears out, yeah. but you know. <laughs> yeah. And we're like, what? This seems longer than I remember it being. Yeah, honest. this whole movie's longer than I remember. Yeah, you know, I was going to say, it's interesting because <laughs> with this movie that, you know, it's like, it really is trying to be Apocalypse Now and kind of feel like, oh, it's like it just kind of moves around. It's like, but that movie has the benefit the tin of cans, like, you know, checking yeah. those tin cans <laughs> uh, of, of being like kind of psychedelic yeah. and, and very much of its era that it's about. Yeah. This doesn't really fit that and it doesn't attempt enough to feel arty and weird as weird as it should if it wants to do that you know what i mean yeah. and it's like too well this blockbuster is to do this that, is in line with the phenomenon that we've been we might have talked about in the past on here but it's a good be a good chance to do it that has been happening recently at us you know we'll pick on the marvel movies a little bit more but this happens with other blockbusters too where the directors of these movies or the screenwriters are like you know Avengers Endgame or it's like Nashville you know yeah. it's like this other thing and it's like you know trying to because it recognizes it's, like, oh, it's you know, not great it's not inherently great or good Captain America right. Winter Soldier is like Parallax View which first of all I actually think Winter Soldier is a little bit better than the Parallax View which might be blasphemy to some yeah. but it's a good nonetheless Parallax View is a good movie but yeah. just all this like oh it's like this it's like that it's like you know that's like stupid. How about that? Yeah. You know? Well, you know. Now I don't think um, Matt Reeves was saying uh, uh, he 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 certainly said Apocalypse Now was an influence. I don't know if he said yeah. it's like it's like the Apocalypse Now with the Planet of the Apes movies. He didn't well, quite say that. Well, it even has but... somewhere Ape Apocalypse Now. It's just like, yeah. Okay. You want a temperature check on this at this point? Pretty cold. I like it. Yeah. That's just me, you know. He's like, I saw what happened. It's like, okay. Drinking his Folgers on the, you yeah. know. Mixed with drink. Yeah. He's, a, he's what uh, one of my students would have called a drunkard. <laughs> they call it the demon drink.
how wide his eyes look. <laughs> There it is. There it is. Do you know that where it was? Do you see it? Mm. But what reason would somebody have to write that? No, I, mean, I guess boredom, you know, the biggest thing. You know, a former cinephile turned soldier really just wanted to make his mark. Yeah. And I remember that when cinema was a thing at this point, you know. I wonder if any cinema is being made in this world, you know? Mm. If Michael Eight, Moore's still hanging Eight's around, like. It. Like Sicko Part 2, Ape City, you know? I don't know. Jesus. <laughs> You're the mayor of Shark City. The mayor of Shite. <laughs> Shite City. Poodoo City. Mega Poodoo One. <laughs> Mega City One, you know? Yeah. The Judge Dredd comics. Uh oh, here's old old friend Koba. Old Toby Kebble back from the dead. I wonder if, like, this Koba being, like, a ghost or, like, a, you know, imagination of his is any attempt to try to be psychedelic and or something yeah. a little different, you know? But, well. Bad ape. Yeah. She go in. <laughs> all this security, all this stuff, and then a little girl can get in yeah. here. You know? Some people call you Maurice. Wow. wow. The oh. pompatus of love. I forgot Maurice. He's on the outside, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. I, thought. I was wrong. <laughs> yeah, toss that in. Kind of bumped him yeah. up, bumped him on the head. By the way, I just want to say this James Corden thing oh my is gosh. the most disgusting thing of all time. We didn't even say anything about that earlier, but yeah, that's been blowing up on the internet in the last... It happened... It was. Uh, I went online yesterday anyway. Thankfully, it but, seems like people are talking about how stupid uh, it is. It's been so. universally despised and panned yeah. on Twitter, as it should be. As he should be, yeah. but sadly not. He's one of the most sycophantic, disgusting celebrities we have, which is saying a lot, frankly. Yeah, It's but, actually an accomplishment to get yeah. to that level. The fact that he even topped Jimmy Fallon in that regard is pretty remarkable. Yeah. If you haven't, if you've somehow been blessed to not see this video, 
there's a video of James Corden and some people that I think was on his uh, show of them dancing around in the streets of L.A. doing a flash mob. I think for that new Cinderella movie that's going to be coming out or something. Okay. Another iteration of that, but um, yeah, no, no bueno. A lot of people were saying like, can you imagine like driving? You can drive to work or being like an ICU nurse and like all the stuff you're dealing with with COVID. And then all of a sudden you get stopped by this friggin' buffoon dancing in a rat costume like outside your and car. All the other the people involved LA. in this, by the way, are are yeah, pretty much scum too. So I mean, you know. Billy Porter, who we found to be funny here and yeah, there, I like, like him, all right. uh, witness his tragic moment. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, so nobody's looking. By the way, yeah, that's sorry, what I've been we, saying. Sorry, like, we she, had to get back to this. She, yeah. she like walked in, nobody saw her, and then, but she is small. I get it, but. I don't know. Or small, as some would yeah. say. S M O L. Oh, that walk, like, yeah, yeah. I'm here. He walked a baby. Ron Perlman would have killed it as a human yeah. villain in these movies. You know, it's one of the most annoying things in a movie to me is when it's raining really hard and people just stand in. Oh, just stand there very stoically. Don't, don't act like it, they wouldn't be aggravated by it. Yeah. You see this all the time in action yeah. movies, yeah. Yeah, I don't really think about that, but that's true. Wouldn't it be kind of funny though? It was like very intense action movie, but then they got like little umbrellas. Yeah, and well, like running around. That would shooting. be more realistic. I mean, well, in probably real life or death situations, people really no, wouldn't care. Yeah, I guess, but, but like, it is something you think about, though. You know, that would be funny to see though. Somebody like a shootout, but they got umbrellas. Yeah. Them. Well. One of the most famous random scenes in older movies is that scene in Foreign Correspondent with all the umbrellas yeah. and like them running yeah. through them, but they're not using umbrellas. So. Mm -hmm. Joel McRae era, yeah. Am I laughing? Joel McRae once asked. You remember that scene in Sullivan's Travels, you know, where like, they're laughing at that movie. He's in that like right. prison, and the people are like, they're literally right. insane. Yeah, it's, pretty, like, it's, it's a kind of exaggerated. It's like yeah. okay, enough. Like, <laughs> and it's just like, I mean, it's a really good scene in a really good movie, but it's just like yeah. okay, stop. Like, I guess they're that hard up, <laughs> but they're like insane. Yeah. Like, I mean, you're not wrong though. A really annoying thing about the trailer to this movie to me was kept doing the apes together strong uh, over and over. It's just like <laughs> quit doing that. Like he got gun. It's like what is it now? That guy with the crossbow is so lame. Yeah. That Michael Rappaport thing is so <laughs> lame. You know. <laughs> referring, he's referring to this uh, Spike Lee video. 
Spike Lee vid. Yes, yeah. They're like 35 minutes left. They don't. Man, I don't remember. It seems it, like it's yeah. like 20, but you know. But you know, like, and then again, this movie is too long. Let me just say that. Yeah. But moment to moment, scene to scene, there's not anything I'm like, this just needs to go. You yeah. know what I mean? There's not like a something very clearly to me that uh, is, quote, bad or really takes away from the movie. No, but other than it could just, just be a general. Sped up yeah. A bit, yeah. Like. Then, I mean, there is almost a certain. It's weird. A certain laziness associated with, like. Yeah. Not cutting things and not and like not making the narrative brisker at times. Yeah. You know. Speaking of the many saints of Newark in that Seppin Mall interview, David Chase was saying that, uh, like, like that new movie's like two hours or less, and is like, and it was insistent that it be sh- shorter as possible because it's just like he was talking about how movies today are too long and like. I know he famously has said in the past, I've heard him say, like, Mildred Pierce got it all done in, like, an hour and 40 minutes. Yeah. And he's like, why can't we do more of that? Like, get it, you know, tell By your story way, and get out of there. Yeah. By the way, did you notice he was doing that, like, Brando impression of, like, I'm just getting there. Like, you yeah, know, yeah, he's yeah. like, <laughs> that real thick, like, I can barely speak, like... So he didn't hear it. Yeah. It just like hit it, you know. What if he just screamed it, looking up yeah. there? <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> oh, there they are! I'm like, oh crap! We we didn't think about that. Look it's away. all resting on Maurice, the, uh, Bad Ape, uh, his, and, and Nova. Nova, yeah, Nova, Nova. What about Yesva? Oh, 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 oh. <clears throat> Excuse me. Just a little bit of that simian flu, you know. Mm. Tasty. Donkey. Donkey. Tasty <laughs> donkey. Did you ever remember playing the Shrek 2 PS2 video game? I remember I've had it, played it on the PS2 for a while back of in the day. What? Shrek 2. No. That was a fun little video game. It had like a co op element where you could play the various characters. It was pretty fun, I remember. Back in the day. Yeah. That was back when, and I'm not even saying this is objectively good or bad, better or worse. This is just what it was. That you know, the late '90s, early 2000s. There was that's still when they did a lot of tie-in video yeah. games. They don't do that as much anymore. I know there's um, a one video game of this that got made for these. That's kind of it's more like those like Telltale games or whatever, where it's a lot. Well, it's basically just a movie, but I'll probably play it at some point just to see what's going on, but. Yeah, and we were we've mused kind of to ourselves of what a good Planet of the Apes video game could be. And, yeah, you know, and I think it's a world that definitely could necessitate of some really cool games. But you know, well, and I beat the drum for it all the time. That Mad Max video game that nobody likes for some reason is like really good. Around the time Fury Road, uh, came out. and I don't know why people don't like that game. Yeah, I've uh, I, I, not played it, but I've seen you play it. And it looks pretty fun. And, yeah, and accurate to the world. I don't you know? know, whatever. You know how gamers are they're just like stupid so uh, they don't really get it am I an ape honorary ape you are Nova The moment. And we we think we mentioned it. I don't remember if we mentioned it here. Apparently there was a O one game or O two based out of that. Yeah, movie, I'd kinda I like to play that, but yeah. Did they have an ad for that on the uh 
VHS, do you remember? I don't remember. Yeah. His facial expressions. That's the thing is like Steve's on secretly the best performance Probably. in all these movies. It like, might be. And again, just how welcome it is to see a little bit of levity thrown in here. Yeah. Again, lets you know, oh, you know, these movies could have used a little bit more of that. Not overboard with it, yeah. but something, you know, like. And I wouldn't doubt, considering how dark these movies are, Reeves understood that. Yeah. And it was like, we need, you know, a little bit of something like that. Because even the original movies have some funny, you know, stuff to them. I mean, yeah. especially that first one, as far as some of the apes, even. But <laughs> it's like an old man. <laughs> I never thought about him kind of looking like Arnold, but I yeah. can't help but see it now. Bad ape. This movie didn't get a McDonald's tie-in, you know? <laughs> yeah. We go, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> How will we do it? We'll go, ooh, real loud, you know? Just to throw them off our scent, you know? <laughs> like, okay. Mm. I was literally just thinking, I forgot this happened. Like, they're going to throw some doo doo here at some point. Or? I mean, that would be very frustrating, nonetheless, you know. <laughs> I mean, that would be a frustration, you know. Well, uh, let's did he admit deserve it. it? Yeah, probably, you know. Well, not probably, just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but. But let's empathize, you know. Because <laughs> that's what he's about to do. <laughs> who did that? It's like when a teacher asks, who did it? Nobody's going to say they did. Like, I say this as a teacher, you know. You gotta recognize your audience. But you know, you know like <laughs> I hate to say this, but sometimes when somebody does something bad and you're like you can't help but kinda of laugh in your head and kinda of think game respect game to yeah. some degree, you know, just like Like I've had a handful of instances where I've had to 
have a conversation with a kid out in the hall, get out in the hall, and deep down, I can't help but laugh at myself for being a teacher doing that. I I got to be honest, yeah. like you know, that well, I'm continuing the tradition, you know, like yeah, got it in his hands. Mm-hmm. The music, like, like, you know, primate intrigue. Well, if he then just pointed the gun and shot Caesar in the head, yeah. and, and then the and movie the, just betray, ended. Betrayal, yeah. Don't stop. Like, <laughs> you know. The children. As that driving instructor in Borat once said, mustn't hurt the children. Yeah. Who's <laughs> one of the few people in Borat that, you know, doesn't, doesn't come off as a bad person. No, he's like, yeah. oh, it's actually all right. Kitties get it. Yeah. <laughs> Incognito monk. Yeah. Incognito monks. Oh yeah, baby. I guess, presumably now, uh, Cornelius is the heir, I guess, after Caesar. Yeah. And if it is based on some kind of a monarchy, a monkarchy, you know? Yeah. Love how defined parts of the wall look, and then other parts yeah. like not that good at all, but... Like stopping off to kill Wayne Grove before you make the plane, you know. <laughs> well, uh, it didn't work out for you know. Mm-hmm. But you gotta respect the principles, you know. Yeah. He could have also stopped by and got a book, of, another book about metals, but you know. That's the thing, is you know, is Harrelson the Wayne Grove of this movie, proverbially. <laughs> One thing I love about Heat, and it's kind of messy actually, but I kind of just love the gumption of it. It's just like that whole subplot of everything revolving Wayne Grove is narratively very unnecessary and very like, yeah. okay, but I kind of like the, the randomness of it though at yeah. the same time. Well, it's going to be that. It got out literally just in time. Yeah. Overlapping yelling. Over, uh, huh? Overlapping dialogue. Hmm? Hmm? Just. <laughs>
monks got, got out. Like, What's really annoying about this character to me is he tries to act all innocent and naive, but he just ultimately he's so just complicit really in everything. Yeah. Well, and he's really evil, too, yeah. in the end. And it's just like, no, like, screw you. This is not going to work out for no. uh, these folks. So. around that Kona. <laughs> he really is channeling Brando here, you know? <laughs> Being drunk, overweight, yeah. incomprehensible. Yeah. Like. Probably talking trash about Burt Reynolds for no reason. Yeah. Like, if you haven't seen, heard that, look that up. Oh, I forgot about the whole ending of this here. Well, until now. So he's not happy. No. For some reason. I don't really know why, but. So I guess the virus has gotten to him, too? Yeah. That, I swear, this dirty little virus is just wreaking havoc. It's, you know? it's sleeping inside us, yeah. I'm telling you. <laughs> I mean, Iggy Pop really is a prophet, you know? Yeah. Iggy Prophet, you know. No, oh, I guess it's that the the virus passed through that to him, I guess. Oh, yeah. Because yeah, he took I, it. Yeah. yeah. The doll. Yeah. Just the it's doll. Just the, just the stupid little plastic doll. <laughs> Cloth doll. <laughs> Raw doll. <laughs> it's like, who's your favorite children's writer? Raw doll. <laughs> I, I, that's Ronald McDonald, you know. It's like the Joker. Yeah. He's like, nope. Through everything, Caesar's still like, I can't do it. Well, no, he's like, no, I want you to be this way. Mm. This is what it ultimately is like. Nope, you're going to suffer. So, And he does have a sense of pity somewhat, but... But also just like, no. Like, look what you've done. Yeah, like, like <laughs> what do you have to say for yourself? Yeah. Like, oh, I'm so sorry. Now I must, now I must watch you strangle today. <laughs> you know what's interesting? I really didn't. You don't really hear a lot of him. He's gonna do it himself, though. In this movie, saying, I hate your kind, this and that. It's really kind of more practical, like, well, it's us versus you, like, you know? Yeah. This is what it is. Tell me I'm a good colonel. Tell me I'm a good kern. R.I.P. to the colonel. Not, but, yeah. Sure. No, but, yeah. <laughs> Not at all, but yeah, sure.
Oh, I remember this run Caesar has here in a little bit. The big explosions yeah. are going on. Uh, well, whoops. America. Just break it down. Break it down. <laughs> break it down. <laughs> You get it, like yeah. You get the American flag on fire coming down, like. It's a random pet peeve I have in a lot of movies when gunfire goes silent, the mm -hmm. battle goes silent. I, most movies like, are very clearly aping the aping. Normandy yeah. beach sequence from Saving Private Ryan, which is so influential i would almost say it's cliche but then you actually go back and really watch it and consider it well and that's it's all not, about like but more about well that's kind of post-traumatic stress yeah, in the battlefield like in this but, it's just like let's just have that happen it's like yeah no, but like i said no i think that purpose. is influenced by the yes, that but yeah, yeah but it's no. a different thing but yeah because i recently I was teaching summer school, American History 2, and had showed the beach scene of Saving Private Ryan to my kids. Yeah. And a lot of them actually hadn't even seen the movie, which was interesting. And that, so that's a sequence that still was just dynamite. Yeah. Lights out. Great. I mean. That SOB. Yes, I'm telling you, like. One of the most annoying characters in any movie I've ever seen randomly. <laughs> I don't know why, because, like... He's probably the most annoying out of these three. Well, there's Tom Felton's character. He was pretty bad. In the yeah. Rise. <laughs> we'll be taking care of business. TCB. Business. Wow. They got lit up like a Christmas yeah. tree. Well, you know. <laughs> I can't believe that. Yeah. That place of shock. Like. Looking out for the homie. time to go between um how harrelson committed suicide earlier and how that moment where they kind of cut away from that i wonder if some of these were moments they edited around or cut around for the get the pg-13 rating if those would have pushed it to an r yeah, or you know, I, don't I don't know to trim the movie back a little bit in terms of getting a pg-13 of course violence you can get away with about anything nowadays and make a pg-13 in a sci-fi action context, yeah. anyways. And people complain all the time about how violence is held, held to a far less of a standard than uh, sex mm -hmm. is yeah. and nudity, and they're, you know, you're, they're right. I mean, holy crap. <laughs> yeah. Massive explosion. That's the end of all their lives. Well, that's that. A yeah, cute little baby orangutan on the far right there. That's what we need in more of these sequels. We need more baby orangutans. Like, single biggest need, you know? Yeah. Another thing I would like to see more of if in future versions is, this might seem like a small thing, but I think it'd actually be a little different, is more gorilla and or orangutan main characters because so far they've always been usually chimpanzees and that's yeah i guess that's kind of this idea of moderation of the people yeah. leading that but i don't know i'd like to see a little more of that but i 
But like I said earlier, it's interesting about this group of humans that are like not even really characterized. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. Uh, Like you said, I think earlier they kind of look like stormtroopers almost. Yeah. Yeah. And we took that down, that base down for what? Yeah, as we've kind of been saying on and off throughout all these movies, is nature takes uh, control yet yeah. again, and they're the and they're uh, better off because they can actually climb trees. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Put out the fire. Yeah. Chief, put out the fire, will you? <laughs> <laughs> no, they're all dead. So. That would be one of the most terrifying things I think you could go yeah. through, actually, is a, a full-fledged avalanche. That's something that we just, where we live, there's like absolutely no threat yeah. whatsoever of that happening, but I know other parts of the world there are, but... He's been through the ring right now, see. Yeah. It's just crazy and kind of a visual metaphor as well. All that hard work, all that fight and all that scrapping, and it just means absolutely nothing after yeah. you know Mother Nature's over again had its say. Like, we win. One did nothing. Yeah. <laughs> What if the colonel just popped out of the stuff? Yeah. Just yeah. Uh, like, yeah. Like it was frozen zombie. That would zombie. be any other movie would do that. Yeah. I mean, I'll say that like this. Like I actually this like that. I, I kind of had the no, several saying, endings too. there. I've forgotten that. Yeah. I like, though, that it's like, like you said, it didn't really characterize those others as any real characters because they end up just getting buried by yeah. nature there. You know, that's its own, like, I think, app visual metaphor. Return to return to monk. Return to, you know, the desert. I will say, yeah, as we're, we're coming all the way back, right. as we're coming to the end of this, this movie actually was a little better than yeah. Uh, I, have I to went say, into it I, thinking I'll it have might to say, be. I think actually that it's just slightly less better than I had remembered. Like I'm going to give it four this time around, yeah. but. Uh, and I give Dawn four and a half probably, yeah. but yeah, but it's still really good. It, yeah, it it padded itself out more than I had remembered. So, and again, is it long? Yeah, could it cut some stuff? Yeah, is it in some ways repetitive of the second movie? Yeah, but I do think it has enough new things to offer that kind of yeah. separate it a little bit uh, after having seen it again. But well, I think even just the what we just talked about that visual image of just all the people dead under the snow and it's just like that's it mm -hmm. I was like oh, okay it's a definitive end well no more war ever again like Like, have you had a rough go of it? Like, what happened? <laughs> I 
which is where James Franco's character walks out real grizzled and has a big yeah. beard. Like, I've been following you the whole time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <coughs> It's actually, again, very similar to Moses in the sense of he himself led his people to the promised land, but he himself was not quite able to enter it, yeah. you know. I never really thought about that, that how yeah, close I, that I, I is. I've kind of thought um, about that before. I, for, but, I have, yeah. but I've forgotten about it. But. Because, again, a lot of the uh, reviews kind of, it did, well, one or two might have said something about Moses. I can't remember. No, I'm thinking about it, but I made that comparison, but. He's pretty apt. Now Bad Ape will rule the show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he does talk now. Took him long enough, though. I will say though, you know, an exchange like this, I feel like more could be less, or less could be more, and this yeah. is a scene that's kind of going. I, I get the meaning, yeah, you know, and the emotions behind it, but when you're looking at, oh, okay, maybe this could be cut, that could be cut, then you know, something to think about. Rest easy, Caesar. Rest in season. Oh, and then there's just that girl with him, you know. Yeah. Nova's just like, oh, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Going to be with Lithgow. <laughs> the great monkey bars in the sky. <laughs> the, the banana grove. Yeah. A little bohemian banana grove in the sky, you know. That's what I'm saying, even the death is taken like Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right, let's you know. Let's put him in the ground, like let's have the funeral service, like let's have the eulogy, like, you know. Nice, peaceful, sedate ending. Mm -hmm. Which again begs the question: Do we still think of this as um, a new ending? Where okay, you know that's yeah. that's what the new reality is of just these apes, or you know the question of. And I'll be curious if they do, you know, inevitably when they make more movies or TV shows or whatever they do, if they'll actually pull from this timeline well, and just act as though this was the prehistory. To what That's what I was going to read here be. about the fourth film. Okay. So, in October of 2016, it was reported that a fourth film in a new series was being discussed. Shortly before the release of War in July of 2017, Reeves said he expressed interest in making more apes films and that Steve Zahn, who played the bat, bat ape in the film, had set up a story for further sequels. Okay. So he came up with something? I guess. Okay. Writer Mark Baumbach hinted that further films will be possible. In April 2019, following the acquisition of 20th Century Fox by Disney, 
Disney or 21st Century Fox. I should yeah. say. Disney announced that future Planet of the Apes uh, films are in development. In August 2019, Disney said that any future installments will take place in the universe's first established in Rise of the Planet of the Apes. So, yes. In February of 2020, Wes Ball was announced as director of the next film with Joe Hartwick Jr. and David Stark serving as producers. Ball explained that the story will take place after the events of War for the Planet of the Apes and continue to follow Caesar's legacy, in quotes. In May 2020, it was announced that Josh Friedman will serve as screenwriter alongside Ball, while Rick Jaffin and Amanda Silver will return to the franchise as producers. So, more or less, they're yeah making more of these, which I had known that this was happening, but I didn't know that it was directly coming from these. So I don't know when that's going to be. Uh, yeah, I'd be curious to know too how the Disney acquisition of this property might impact it. Yeah, uh, or change it up. Um. So here we are. Yeah. We done well, it. We finished it. Yep. Uh, and I mean, I'm obviously looking forward to way more Planet of the Apes movies. Um, and we'll definitely be doing them here eventually. But um, Yeah. And so um, let's, let's, okay, let's kind of start f- small and then we'll get bigger. Okay. Thinking about this trilogy first, I guess. Yeah. Again, I actually coming on the other side of this one feel a little bit better about it yeah. than I maybe did going in. I do still acknowledge again, and I still maintain that these three movies, for me personally, the CGI does give me a little bit of a remove from yeah. totally buying in. However, it's undeniable how first great they are, and second of all, that it is just something different, and it yeah. is trying to be something different yeah. from the franchise of which I respect. What are maybe some final thoughts you have yeah, just about I, this trilogy? Pretty much in particular? the same thing. I think that um, more than anything, I appreciate um, the um, willingness that the writers and the directors of uh, these movies have had with wanting to really make something of this, and uh, not that there wasn't, not that the other ones before weren't worth something, but to really like, all right, let's really make, try to really make characters out of non-human characters, you know, and and have them not, but still not be like the original incarnations of like Cornelius or Zero or whatever. Yeah, because um, even the original movies, you know, the first two especially, you know, the they're mostly told through human, human first person. Yeah. Kind of main characters. Right. But then the franchise pivots like from three, four, and five into being now the apes are more mm-hmm. the main characters. And so even within that, there was an evolution that took yeah. place. Right. Um, but one, the, and one yeah. could argue that James Franco obviously was an important character in the first one, but Caesar was the main yeah. character even right. still. Yeah. You know? And um, I just think that ultimately, I'm just thankful that there are movies that have gotten people interested in these movies again. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I just think they're good. So, well, talk, in, in general, thinking about the larger franchise, and we've talked about this from the very beginning, but just to wrap it up, how do you think these movies function as not only kind of the sci-fi action blockbuster movies, but just as works of Hollywood cinema and what they have to say, what they continue to say, and what they can maybe say in well, the future? Well, and I think they're, and everybody said this basically about these new ones in particular, is that they're consistently the smartest big-budget movies that get made because they actually... Um, care about actual, you know, issues now, whether or not, and, and political ideas and cultural ideas. Now, whether or not that's always conveyed in these new movies to the extent that they could be is, you know, obviously questionable, not the ca- is time, questionable. Yeah. but they're doing it way more than most other blockbusters are. Right. Um, or in more direct ways, at least, and not in negatively indirect ways that, sure. um, that can be criticized. Um, as far as the original movies go, I mean, they were always on the cutting edge in that sense, um, from the very beginning. So those all, and then of course the, uh, Tim Burton film did nothing for that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I think that they represent the high watermark that, um, science fiction action blockbuster filmmaking can still get to, which is strange for movies that are literally about apes that talk and yeah. move around that it seems very quaint and goofy to be that that's still being made now it does um, get back to but, like just a kind of a, i think a classical idea though of you know us versus apes or in terms of these comparisons that have been yeah. had all throughout the years going back thousands of 
years before that even, you know. And so um, that classic us versus them mentality. And I think, you know, obviously above all else, they work best as metaphors for our own world, humans. Yeah. In terms of how we can divide one another, how we can characterize one another, um, and how we can tear ourselves apart. While also, and again, each of these movies in their own way, take the time to find empathy in someone different than ourselves. And I think yeah. that's one real big thing that right. will always be foregrounded in this franchise just because that is what right. the inherent ingredients of it are. Yeah. Always about trying to have empathy for others and why you might not understand someone else to try to understand them. Right. Uh, is, and how sadly... You know, and you can't, and you can't yeah. have a better central message of a franchise, frankly, than that. Yeah, and think. how sadly it often doesn't work out, out that way and that's a realistic you know conclusion but also you know what all other things great about it's horse uh, you know uh apes riding around on horses and shooting stuff and going and, oh, 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 you know, so, noises and you yeah know. i mean and again yeah. i think we talked about this back with the original is that these that that original and then many all these other ones to some extent have really straddled the line well between like the profound and the absurd, like yeah. like having a good time watching a movie, but also it, it you're not going around empty-handed with zero calories right. going in either. They're not yeah. empty empty calories, I'd yeah. say. That it is something thought-provoking and something that challenges you just by virtue of what it is. So, yep. So we got through Love it. Love them, but gonna take a break. Yeah, so, gonna take a break. Uh, and we'll go ahead and say that I doubt uh, in the future we'll be doing very many. Uh, uh, as many series as we yeah, thought. Yeah, um, because... we won't name them any, any now because we actually have talked about certain series or franchises. We'll leave that up to suspense for now. Of some we had, um, and while we really enjoy the experience of doing yeah. all these, we do want to take a break from that because I, for one, really value early on in our podcast. And so what most of our podcast has been like, yeah. is jumping movie to movie, week to week, yeah. and kind of experiencing whatever the context of that is. So, we do have plans to one day kind of go back and do some other franchises, but we're going to give it some time. Yeah. And like we've said, we'll eventually come back to these. Yeah. Um, and now, when, we also the, plan to have thoughts the, about even the animated series and the live action yeah, series. Uh, yeah. We might come back with just a random little bonus epilogue yeah. episode on right. those. So, yeah, be on the lookout for that one of these days. I don't know when that'll be necessarily, but. Uh, so, we went ape, but we survived. Yep. We made it. So. Thanks for anyone who joined us yep. on this journey. It's been a two month, uh, I would say slog, but it hasn't been until kind of towards the end. It was getting a little bit. All right, let's let's get through this. So yeah, but yeah, that's natural, I think. Yeah. So usually we do our bonus episode after every ten, and we're gonna go back to that model um, eventually when we kind of reset. And uh, but we next week want to put out a special episode, our bonus episode. Of all things, commemorating um, the tragedy and the aftermath of September 11th, the terrorist attacks on September 11th. It'll be the 20th anniversary of mm-hmm. that, actually, when that episode will drop on September 10th, the day before the 20th anniversary. Um, you know, I was born in 1992. Levi was born in 1998. So much of our whole understandings and conceptions of the world have been centered around, based upon molded in many ways mostly unfortunately of course by the events of that day and so we just want to kind of spend some time on that 20th anniversary kind of talking about how that has informed our own lives our own understandings of the world um and what there is to take away 20 years later Mm -hmm. um you don't have to look too far in the news to see what's going on in afghanistan now kind of the end of that 20-year mission whatever that mission was and we're going to kind of talk about maybe a little bit next week yeah. uh, what the attempts of that were and what its resolution says um and so it's just something that's very you know it weighing heavily i think i know it's been weighing heavily on me knowing that it's gonna be 20 years since those yeah. events um and it's something that it, we'll talk about this next week something that i distinctly remember you were younger and so i don't remember don't the really event re- specifically at all um but yeah and so we're going to talk about that a little bit next week, and um, and I'll go and tell you we're not going to be doing a lot of joking in that. There's no. not going to be any yeah. laughs had. There's not really going to be any drops of any kind, all except one I have planned for the end of any. I mean, we're going to be very, you know, we want to take this very seriously, and there's no yeah. other way to take it, frankly. Yeah, because uh, I'll preview something a minor 
thing I'll say next week that I don't feel personally um, in my lifetime, um, which has been essentially since then. I'm, I only turned 23 a few days ago, so I'm you know all just slightly older than the event. Yeah, you're barely three years it. old. Yeah, um, that it's strange. It it's I do I wouldn't say that people don't take it seriously because I think there are a lot of people um, that do in this country. Um, but also, you know, and I get it, it's a thing of the people I grew up around and, and I'm not saying that I took it very seriously when I was younger either. It was just something that, I mean, it, I mean, you still see the images today and it, it boggles the mind and is hard to comprehend, but that I still feel that even today, the further we get away from it, the less seriously people take the event and, um, that's just something that really concerns me and terrifies me. Or try that, to take the event and make it serve their political purposes. Yeah, on one and side they, or the other, they like yeah. to, uh, people like to do that. And um, for me, I feel like no, I mean, this is kind of previewing next week. I feel like we haven't really learned very many lessons from that and um, on what there is to learn. Um, we have in certain ways and not in others. Um, but that, yeah, I find it very concerning that people don't uh, take it very seriously, and 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 it's interesting for me too of teaching middle schoolers that I'm gonna kind of, I'm not really gonna have a whole lot of time to discuss this stuff with them, and also I'm not a social studies teacher, I'm more of an English teacher, but I'm gonna kind of talk to them about it a little bit, but um, that I'm interested to, you know, but I am both interested and disinterested to see what they would have to say about it because they are 10 years removed from me in age and it even further in age a lot of these kids are born in like 2009 yeah which is hard for, yeah you know, it's just wow to me yeah um but that because i know people are always like oh i'll say oh i'm starting to feel old and they're like oh you ain't old blah 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 and i'm like uh you know i can I can have feelings of time passing too. You know, I don't know if people are just aware because, of that. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, older people. Right. But I, and I'm not trying to say that to be mean or nothing. Yeah. But I'm just saying like it's hard for me to believe I'm teaching kids who were born in 2009. I, I, but yeah, um, I'll tell a brief story here, and I'll tell this again yeah. next week. At the end of this past school year, it was in May of 2021. Um, it was at the very end, and we had kind of got through most of the information. You know vast majority of the information we needed and is literally at the very last day and i felt a certain responsibility because a lot of these kids i knew you know obviously i'm not going to have again in the fall yeah. when it is really the 20th anniversary so i felt a certain responsibility to show them a part of the cnn docuseries the 2000s that had some footage from the september 11th attacks and talked about it a little yeah. bit and i don't even say this to get mad at the kids no. it was frankly an instructive yeah. and important thing for me to understand is that i was showing some of that footage and I had a handful of kids, and this happened not just in one class, this, a version of this happened in all my classes, of a kid or two raising their hand and going, and pointing to the screen and saying, is this real footage? And at first I was just shocked. I was like, yeah. what do you mean this is this real footage? And like, it just doesn't look real. I don't know. It just looks like a video game, or it looks just like... Yeah. And and again, I don't say this to mock the kids or to get yeah. mad at them. It was honestly instructive for me to go, as people who grew up and their whole conceptions of the world were shaped by that day and we saw that footage a time and time and yeah. time again i remember those days immediately after that's all you saw on tv over and over again it was weird you know it's frankly in some ways discouraging yeah but also in another way uplifting that they don't have that scar and that wound that so many other people do when they see that. Well, right? that they don't yeah. have that connection. And that teaches you that they have been born into a society that culturally has been so infused with the imagery of 9-11 right. that they see that as just any old thing. Like any blockbuster you would yeah, see. Yeah, and it's like, like no, something. that actually happened and yeah and yeah so that and so yeah i'm interested to uh, like i said i'm both interested and in disinterested in what the kids have to say i guess i'm just disinterested because i'm like well frankly it's not going to be anything relevant that they have i to, think it but it, you know you know it's but, like it's one of those things like talking about like pearl harbor or talking about like the jfk assassination you know as a hi historically minded person 
I obviously didn't see any of those yeah. things happen. Right. But I still very distinctly understand the gravity of that, particularly with yeah. JFK, right. uh, because we're even further removed from Pearl Harbor yeah. even now right. than that is. Um, but, you know, I still understand the gravity of that. And as someone who as a child was impacted by the gravity of that, it still has meaning for me. Um, now, ostensibly, this is a film and to some degree a television podcast that we talk about things. Mm -hmm. So we are going to spend a little bit of time next week actually talking about and parsing some cinema and television that we believe um, are just inherently works of post-9-11 world. Doesn't mean they're necessarily great, doesn't mean they're necessarily bad, but they make their own attempt to grapple with the world after, excuse me, 9-11. So, um, but also, again, we want to talk about just our own thoughts and ideas and interpretations of what that day's meant and all the days that have followed 20 yep. years later what it means and let me just say that even as a it's weird because i, ha- I started having my first memories around age three and four so i i ba- i don't remember the event exactly but i've lived i've had memory since then right. consistently more or less and it's just really uh, surreal for me to realize that the event that you know it, and I'm going to talk about this next week it's strange to think that the major event the defining moment of the 21st century happened within the first two years of it yeah. um, and that how rarely such a thing happens. yeah because World War One didn't um, really get kickstarted until right. 1914 mm-hmm. as far as the 20th century and, goes yeah. and I don't know maybe we'll live all of the 21st century God willing and think no, I guess that wasn't the, and something else will happen or something. But I feel that who knows COVID in and some maybe way COVID could, uh, in a way could be too. That's true. Um, but I just feel that nine eleven has such a significance over so many things that it only can be that. And um, and that anyway, what I was gonna say is that it's just hard for me to believe it's been twenty years, even as somebody who was so young when it happened that hardly remembers it, but I distinctly remember um, the world after that and the war on terror shaped my view um, of reality in ways that thankfully I have been released from over time. Um, but that still, that's just a, a the 2000s in, in, in general or, or a decade that continually haunt me in uh not necessarily in bad ways but just in but in, i mean those are all your coming of age yeah years and, and, and that yeah. i feel that it's a mystery of an of a decade that i've that i'll never solve exactly and yeah i live through it and that's what makes yeah. it even more confusing yeah. so yeah yeah so we're gonna but walk anyway. through all this stuff yeah. next week um and again we're gonna i think spend most of the time talking about this stuff but also a little bit of, like i said about some of the film and television that has come as a result of that uh, good, bad, or indifferent. Mm-hmm. Um, but we wanted to end this episode with a special tribute to uh, Charlie Watts, who was, of course, the legendary drummer mm-hmm. for the Rolling Stones, who passed away just this past week. Um, you know, it's one of those things, you, you know, I certainly don't have, uh, I was not around for the 60s and 70s. I was, again, born in 1992. Yeah. But so much of the music from that era, I was actually telling. Uh, saw our mutual friend, oh, former teacher Jim Diedrich, oh, okay. just on Friday night. Uh, for oh, the really? Game, okay. And talked yeah. to him a little bit. And I was talking about um, watching uh, Fast Times at Ridgemont High yeah. recently, mm-hmm. and we'd watched that. Yeah. And I was telling him about how, you know, and that's kind of music from the late seventies, early eighties, mm-hmm. very yeah. particularly. But like so much of the music from that movie, I was like watching and listening, and I was just like, oh, this song and this song, and yeah, you know, like oh, uh, and. Uh, and I graduated high school 10 years ago. So I graduated in 2011. And I was thinking, oh, wow, like, you know, this is like the songs of my childhood. And then I stopped and I was like, this is not made for my yeah, childhood. Right. This is actually, I'll just listen to so much classic rock radio and so much rock music from the 60s, 70s, into the 80s. And now how much and now. And, no, and no. informed me. Yeah. And I felt like it was my music, even though generationally that's not quite so. Right. In that way, and I'm certainly no completionist and know every album and know every deep tra- deep cut and everything. But the Rolling Stones, I mean, when you think about rock and roll bands, yeah, they're maybe at the top of the list in terms of just like yeah. at their prime, are. like what yeah. rock and roll music ideally sounds like and is Rolling Stones, you know. And of course, Mick Jagger 
and you know Keith Richards. I mean, they're the ones that are most immediately iconic and everybody knows. Yeah. But of course, you're not going to have that band if you don't have Charlie Watts on the drums, right. um, and some of his you know legendary uh, solos that he had as yeah. well. Um, any thoughts on Charlie Watts? Uh, kind of well, I mean, of course, he's gotten a lot of um, tributes in the past week, and and I I don't know that I can add much other than that um, he was a very integral part of one of the greatest bands that has ever and he was with them from practically the very beginning yeah and um that's what i was going to check to make sure before i said this but it's strange to think that um as far as um uh other than i guess probably ian stewart i'm looking to make sure here um Yeah, probably other than like Ian Stewart, this is the biggest member of the Rolling Stones to die in fifty years since Brian Jones right. died in nineteen sixty nine, and and that just makes you realize too what a incredibly you know how incredibly blessed we have been as a society to have been graced with the Rolling Stones for as long as we have compared to so many other bands that have mostly uh, faded away or broken up or, or, yeah. or right or passed away and faded out and but that we got them as long as we did and um and yeah charlie watts is great i mean he's a little more of one of the more docile of the group so i don't know that the group will be able to keep it together after he's gone now well there's there's a lot of stories but, that came out over the years how he was yeah the rock of the group and yeah. how um the calm behind all the excess and what everybody knows of Mick Jagger and and Richards, you know. So, um, and what, what was really fascinating to me is Paul McCartney had a very moving tribute that he put up, uh, right when he died. Um, talking about what a great guy he knew him to be. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, very touchingly, I saw a picture of Ringo Starr put up of them two together. And obviously, you know, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, like those two drummers together, you couldn't help but kind of feel emotional seeing those two together, you know. Um, So, in honor of Charlie Watts, and also in honor of coming to the end of the Ape franchise, we thought we'd play you out with a little bit of Monkey Man. So, this is Kyle. This is Levi. R.I.P. to both Ed Asner and uh, Charlie Watts. We dedicate this to them. This entire series, we dedicate to them. So, take care. God bless.
Goodbye. We finally really did it.